Welcome everyone to day two of the EY Global Blockchain Summit 2021. Here is your host, Paul Brody. Hi everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, welcome, thank you. Thanks for coming back. I'm Paul Brody, still the global blockchain leader, even though I had my doubts this morning when my badge uh, didn't work on a badge reader. So, uh, but yeah, no, apparently still global blockchain leader. This is day two of our blockchain summit. And it is time for us to do a couple of important things. First of all, there have been some fears that I do not own any shirts with collars. So I did want to prove that wrong. And then secondly, I wanted for us to get into kind of the deep dive discussions, the master classes that we have scheduled for today, because we have a really terrific lineup for today. Before I get into today's content, just a couple of things. First of all, the full video presentation from our, our uh, keynote summit day yesterday is now posted on the EY blockchain site, the registration site, the, the video has been chapterized so you can find your favorite moments and save them as souvenirs. I, I don't think we have any plans to sell them as NFTs at the moment, um, but it's been chapterized. The video quality is much better. Last year, we had some complaints that we apparently shot all the video with a potato. Um, and I don't know why anybody would say that we shot the video with a potato, but this year we are using an HD potato. And so the video quality is, is much better. Uh, and additionally, all the presentations that we have from yesterday, including my keynote, is in PDF form on the, the Blockchain Summit site. You just click on the, the speaker segment and you'll see the presentation there as well. Now, in terms of our agenda today, we are focused on manufacturing and the public sector. I am, and I think all of us at EY are big believers in this idea that blockchain technology can really make the world a better, a better place. And uh, I think from time to time, we get disappointed with how things have turned out in the past with new technologies. Every time a major new technology platform comes along, it's an opportunity for us to learn from that past experience and do a better job. And I, I hope we're going to do that. Today is all about uh, public service. And our opening keynote today is going to be Advit Nath from the International Fund for Agricultural De and Agricultural Development, which is IFAD. And he's going to be joined by Mark McDonald to talk about transformation of the public sector and achieving high levels of transparency and accountability in the public sector. Now, before we go into that keynote presentation, let me just tell you a little bit about what's on the agenda for the rest of the day. Our first master class will start at 11:10 a.m. And that's going to be all about tokenizing government programs and tracking results. And Shagufta Sayani, Devin Yarbrough, and Robert Judson from EY are going to lead you through how we are doing this with our public finance manager solution and how we're working with multinational institutions to structure these programs and track results. Our second master class will start at 12.15 Eastern time, and that is tokenizing supply chain assets. I think you may be detecting a bit of a theme here, right? And here we have uh, today the All Italy Blockchain Superstar team, Raphael Payer, Giuseppe Peroni, and Federico De Poli from EY Italy, and Federico Sanella from Peroni. So uh, this is going to be an amazing team. They're going to talk about uh, tokenization of supply chain assets uh, in blockchain on the public Ethereum network. And then our third and final masterclass of the day is going to start at 1.20 p.m. Eastern, and that's all about complex calculations and workflows with smart contracts. Karthik Salapurum from EY and Siddharth Pendy from Microsoft are going to lead us through a deep dive in the work that we're doing with Microsoft. We've got over 300 companies that are on the Microsoft Xbox smart contract network. I don't think that we have a client in the world that is doing more sophisticated, complex, and fully integrated into ERP business transactions than Microsoft. And Karthik and Siddharth are gonna take you through exactly how we're doing that. We're gonna wrap up today with a closing keynote from Peter Zilgavis from the European Commission. And he's gonna talk about how the EU has made blockchain a technical and strategic priority and the framework and tools that they are setting up to make that happen and to encourage innovation within the European Union. Now, before I hand over to our opening speaker, just a couple of key points. First of all, in between the sessions today, we've got some fantastic commentary from my EY colleague, James Canterbury, and from D Dr. Kyriakos Koparis from the World Food Program. And secondly, as we did yesterday, we've got a new proof of attendance protocol token. So don't forget to claim yours. One of the comments apparently we got yesterday was, I came for the POAP token, 
and I stayed for the content. So uh, again, come for the token, stay for the content, and I'll be back at the end of our discussion today with some closing comments. Without any further delay, let me hand it over to Mr. Nath and Mr. McDonald. Thank you very much, Paul. It's great to be here. And for all of you joining, welcome to this masterclass, uh, where I'll share prediction into the future of blockchain in international development. I'll also share some real life examples of how the United Nations and similar actors are moving from experimentation to real uses of blockchain. And this is all to improve the value chain of services to the world's poorest people. So let's start with the problem. We have multiple crises dovetailing. A recent report by the World Bank says the pandemic combined with climate of the crisis and crippling debt burdens have reversed decades of progress on poverty, healthcare, and education. And 120 million people have been pushed back into extreme poverty and hunger in 2020. That's a billion people or almost two in 10 people on earth that live on less than $2 a day, mostly living in rural areas. The challenge is clear. And today we'll reimagine how technology and blockchain in particular can be used to improve the lives of this bottom billion. So my prediction is in the near future, within two to five years, blockchain will be the primary technology used in almost every process that involves goods and services moving across the globe, including for international development. Already we're seeing big leaps from blockchain tourism in a few years ago to real implementations. And blockchain now features within the top five strategic priorities of a significant number of entities. It is proving to be not only an exciting technology, but integral to the innovation strategies of organizations. And not adopting blockchain technology is increasingly being seen as a loss in competitive advantage for companies and entities. Why do I say this and what is blockchain? So there's been a lot of hype about blockchain, we know that mainly because it's the technology behind Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. But now the power of the technology is being harnessed in the public sector, including for healthcare, education, land, agriculture, and supply chains, among many other areas. And we'll deep dive into a few of these shortly. A great example to start with is Estonia, uh, which has been called the world's most digital country by Forbes. And it's one of the first nation states to connect all of government through blockchain. And today, 99% of public services to citizens are e-services, such as making voting digital and uh, making it more easy and secure to file a tax return digitally, uh, patient data um, storage on a blockchain and retrieval with e-prescriptions, property title, transfer and protection, and a digital court system and state newspaper as well. Every citizen has a digital ID and a signature, and you don't have to carry a driver's license because a police officer can make an inquiry on the blockchain to confirm you have a valid license. So this puts power in the hands of citizens who can trust 100% their government data because we, we know we can verify its integrity independently in almost real time. So in this example of e-government, everyone in the country is also a stakeholder participating in the success of the blockchain. And it positively impacts everyone in that way. There are many other countries, mainly in Eastern Europe and the Caribbean, who are using and uh, looking to use and implement similar approaches to Estonia. So we've looked at an example of how blockchain can be used in the public sector, which is starting to be called GovTech. Uh, but what is blockchain? Now, fundamentally, it's a ledger or a database. It, in contrast to traditional transaction systems controlled by centralized authorities, such as a bank, blockchain technology enables the distribution of responsibility among all participating computers, which share the same information, use a consensus process to validate transactions and monitor records collectively. So once the participating computers reach a consensus on the validation, the transaction is written into a block, which becomes almost impossible to change or delete. There are two main types of blockchains, the public permissionless blockchains, where anyone who wishes can participate in the network, help maintain the ledger, 
and see all the transactions that are taking place. And there's private permission blockchains where the information and maintenance of the network are restricted to a selected group of members. Uh, we used to use um, the physical checkbooks to keep track of transactions and historically checkbooks have been private, except you may have shared them with your spouse or your family, but no one else. Now with blockchain, the checkbook transactions are public. As an example, if someone paid someone else $10, the parties can still be private or anonymous, but the transaction is public. The key question that's asked is, how do you prove the transaction happened and there's no double spending? So this is the genius of Santoshi Nakamoto, who is still a mystery. We don't know who he, she, or they are, but Nakamoto created the blockchain concept in a white paper and explained this key feature of blockchain. So this is how it works. There are actors on the network called miners who compete to solve a mathematical proof to lock transactions into everyone's ledger. If someone wants to hack the transactions, they have to undo every prior transaction. So they do this to earn a percentage of transaction fees, which allows this whole ecosystem of miners to exist on the public uh, blockchain. What's interesting about this system is that there's no central authority. Each person supervises the other. There's no central fee system either, so each person says how much they're willing to pay. There could be no cost for small transactions between known actors and a small cost for large transactions where parties wish to have miners validated. So let's look at some examples of blockchain applications in the United Nations system and similar organizations. So everything from creating a digital ID to making cash transfers and digital payments, uh, tracing funds and commodities, improving supply chains, and others. At the International Fund for Agricultural Development, or IFAD, uh, which is the organization I work for, we launched a project called Trace, where we have proved we can trace funds from the donor, so the funds coming in from donors, to the farmer. The problem is, while we have traditional top-end financial systems, such as an enterprise resource planning system layered with an internet banking solution that's used in over 100 locations worldwide, these traditional means of data capture truly miss key opportunities. Uh, we in IFAD disperse over $1 billion a year to support farmers. And in addition to fully uh, tracking funds from donor to farmer, the blockchain uh, also captures development results directly from farmers through a mobile phone. It allows us to speed up payments to near instant payments to vendors through a blockchain feature called smart contracts, which I understand there's going to be a masterclass on later on as well, and ensure compliance with anti-money laundering rules as all actors in the value chain become fully visible. In one project in Kenya, where we normally give funding to a handful of government partners, uh, with blockchain technology, we managed to trace almost 20 government partners and vendors and almost 30 farm associations that represent 180,000 farmers. These were largely invisible before. So our donors would love this because it shows transparency and results uh, for taxpayer funds that are used effectively for development aid. So we used an Ethereum platform uh, starting off as a private permission system with connectors called APIs to existing systems of the donor or government um, or other partners we deal with. And where they don't have big systems, we were able to allow them to use a mobile phone application for vendors and farmers, for example. So there's no major cost to any actor to connect to the blockchain. Um, this project was a collaboration with EY, who were the technical brains behind the implementation, and we're now moving to expand into other projects and then scale up. So if we were to step back and just imagine the potential for applying what we did at EFAD to all development aid dollars, which officially is $150 billion a year, but if you add remittances, foreign direct investment, and debt equity instruments, this figure approaches $2 trillion per year. So imagine the 1,000 plus or thousands and tens of thousands of development actors, donors, United Nations entities, development finance institutions, NGOs, civil society, private sector entities, having a solution for traceability using blockchain. It would revolutionize our humanitarian development fully. So let's look at a few other interesting real examples in the UN system. 
So the World Food Program, which is the largest humanitarian organization in the world, and also last year's Nobel Peace Prize winner, has a blockchain project they call Building Blocks. So the goal is to use blockchain to make fast, secure, and cheap cash transfers to beneficiaries who can then buy food with the cash. Um, they've created a neutral platform. They've fully and jointly owned and operated by its members, and it allows other aid organizations to coordinate and uh, collaborate for the delivery of assistance. There's almost a million refugees who benefit from these cash transfers who are spread out in refugee camps. And, and this is logistically very complicated. And four years of operation, over $150 million has been transferred with over 8 million transactions. It's also scalable across countries and it's used in Jordan, in Bangladesh and in Lebanon uh, late last year. Also, other UN agencies have joined, which shows the potential of the collaboration uh, impact. So the, uh, the UN Women Organization uh, used the same technology for cash transfers to women re refugees in camps in Kenya, for example. The benefits are seen in reduced costs as there's no need for an intermediary, such as a bank um, and data sharing uh, is possible. The UN Refugee Agency or UNHCR connects um, to the blockchain and sends secure encrypted identifications and IDs of validated refugees to the blockchain. And then the World Food Program or UN Women can use those IDs to issue cash transfers to legitimate refugees. So this also cuts down on fraud. Another big benefit is offering a safe solution to transfer funds to women in um, via digital payments. Another interesting project from WFP is the Blocks for Transport project, which tracks the movement of goods between countries and aims to reduce shipment times and ensure availability of shipping documents using blockchain for the supply chain and logistics aspects. So it has shown that in a supply chain corridor between Djibouti and Ethiopia, the results show they were able to reduce the shipping time from 20 days to three days. And their future vision is to offer a blockchain in a modular uh, way. So that supply chain, uh, plat it's a supply chain platform for various humanitarian entities that, that wish to join. The United Nations Development Program or UNDP has a project led by its country office in Ecuador. So when a chocolate bar is purchased in designated locations worldwide in, in shops, the buyer, receives a token that can be sent directly to the farm in Ecuador. Or the buyer can choose uh, to use their token for a discount on a future purchase. And four tokens means a new cocoa tree can be planted, for example. So this project uses blockchain to track cocoa from the point of origin to the sale as chocolate bars. UNDP has another project in its Serbia country office, which has developed uh, a public blockchain based tracking system for food donations from supermarkets to the recipient NGO. So what it does is it tracks food from farm production to delivery to supermarkets, to collection by food banks, and finally to donation, uh, donations to individuals. Uh, UNDP Moldova is developing a solar coin where investors would use the solar coins to purchase solar cells in panels, and they could then lease these cells to local businesses to recoup the cost of installation of the equipment. The Food and Agricultural Organization, or FAO, has a livestock traceability project for pig farmers in Papua New Guinea, which uses blockchain as well. So it allows consumers to see the history of the products they are buying to give them choice and puts information in the hands of consumers, which helps farmers gain trust and even receive a fair return now that they're showing the cost that they incur in bringing products from farm to table. The UN International Computing Center is working with the UN uh, Staff Pension Fund uh, to set up a digital ID for selected UN staff. So they piloted the project on 300 retirees living in 70 countries. And the potential is to expand this pilot to the entire UN workforce, um, which has strong potential for streamlining of services and reducing costs so that more funding can go towards uh, the poorest people, which is the mandate of the UN agencies. UN Habitat in Afghanistan um, is using blockchain to track the ownership of parcels of land and build a digital registry 
So the land records are created on a blockchain, which is then the basis for receiving a suite of other government services. Land registration can also be used uh, in so many contexts, particularly when there's a displacement of people um, due to climate change or conflict, um, and the pieces of paper showing ownership can easily be lost. Uh, and paper records at government offices are not very reliable always. So this also can uh, truly help support women who rightfully own the land. UNICEF, the UN Children's Fund, has an interesting project in um, Kazakhstan uh, to digitize agreements that it has with many implementing partners, such as governments, vendors, NGOs, and civil society actors. They use the blockchain smart contract feature with a broader goal to automate and speed up cash transfers to partners. With smart contracts, which is a computer program linked to the blockchain, there's a streamlined verification of the results achieved by the partners, and then automatic payment occurs, which speeds up payments to vendors. It also gives visibility to where things stand in the project, and the results achieved um, are faster payments and much reduced paperwork. As another interesting project from UNICEF, they have a cryptocurrency fund, which they accept certain cryptocurrencies and have set up vendors in some countries who accept the cryptocurrency as payment to build schools for children, for example. The World Health Organization, WHO, is using blockchain to combat against counterfeit medications and goods such as face masks, as well as creating a COVID-19 vaccination certificate infrastructure on the blockchain. Uh, the UN Environment Program has a climate warehouse project to track carbon emissions. So these are, these are some examples of how the UN system is using blockchain. And some of the development finance institutions as well, um, such as the World Bank, uh, have issued uh, a second round of bonds for over $100 million on the capital markets, fully using blockchain technology from beginning to end. So let's look at the benefits of the technology in the use cases discussed. So what we've done is we've removed the intermediary. Um, thus, there's an administrative uh, savings and there's cost savings as well. We have security of data because blockchain uses cryptography and encryption. We have comfort that the data cannot be changed. We have, we have captured new data, which has been hard to do before because you now have visibility of new actors in the ecosystem. We have sharing of data and visualizing data in ways we never could before. We also have traceability of funds, of goods, of services as well. And generally, we see more trust in the system and we can make faster payments to vendors. We can also ensure compliance for anti-money laundering due to more visibility and reduced uh, fraud and waste. Uh, there's also the possibility of creating tokens or digital assets and we put the power in the hands of the users in the end. So we can see that this is also, um, it's easily scalable relative to other means of scaling up technologies and at a fairly reasonable cost as well. So we've talked about the benefits, we've talked about some examples, but what about the risks? Because there's always risks. Um, it's important to just discuss the risks um, as no technology solution ever comes without risks. But it's also a matter of putting it in perspective and understanding how to mitigate those risks. It's best to know what the risks are up front, uh, making the right choices, and avoid those risks materializing or mitigating them to the extent possible. So one key risk is how do we handle sensitive information and whether we place it on the blockchain in the first place. Generally speaking, we can choose not to place sensitive information on the blockchain and actually store it off chain, as we call it, in a secure database. So this does still open up the risks that we have today of a central server being hacked. And we've seen there's been hacks of central servers, such as governments, including the so-called Lazarus heist at the Central Bank of Bangladesh, where $100 million was stolen, and it could have easily been $1 billion, except for one astute analyst and some good luck. So um, other hacks have happened. Uh, in big companies like Sony, Adobe, Equifax, LinkedIn, to just name a few. So publicly accountable entities also have a responsibility to protect sensitive beneficiary information, such as names, birth dates, biometrics, of, such as eye scans or fingerprints, and other data um, of their beneficiaries, because these are vulnerable people in the end. 
they aren't trusting aid agencies with their information. And if it's in the wrong hands, it could also be used to discriminate against them. So even anonymous uh, beneficiary identifiers should be hashed or encrypted on a private permission network for added security. One can also um, use secure input methods to control beneficiary interaction. Another security measure is to prevent um, identity theft and asset theft. So identity on a blockchain is based on possession of a combination of private and public cryptographic keys. It's very important to protect one's private keys, uh, which is the secure counterpart of the public key. If one loses a private key, one could lose access to one's records and assets. So keeping these secure, and particularly when it comes to beneficiaries, keeping their private keys secure is very important. There could be a situation where certain vulnerable groups may need aid agencies to keep uh, the private key for them on their behalf and eventually hand them over once conditions permit. This does come with risks, uh, but there are also risks of losing private keys. So it's a challenge to get that balance right. Having reliable backups of data is also key if one is uh, to be on a fully public um, blockchain. So from a personal privacy perspective, personal data must be fully protected through the whole life cycle of use of that data, from capture to decommissioning to destruction. And that's a responsibility of aid agencies to, who collect this data. If data of individuals is to be used, such as pictures, um, it's also important and good practice to have signed consent forms for use and storage of that beneficiary data. There's also a need to have some audits and uh, on data protection and cyber policies, including reviewing the coding of the system at regular intervals, particularly if we're not on a public blockchain framework. One of the other challenges that we see a lot on um, in, in the developing world is internet connectivity. If it drops intermittently, is there any loss of transactions or risk of duplication of transactions? Now, there are ways to mitigate against this risks and more sophisticated uh, solutions are, are coming to fruition uh, regularly. And using uh, blockchain uh, cloud infrastructure, uh, there's many out there, such as the Amazon AWS service, Microsoft has some, IBM has uh, service as well. Um, and, and there are many others that could be used. So another challenge is cost the integration of existing systems, building applications for mobile phones and linking these uh, payment and settlement systems to the blockchain does have a cost. And while it may be a much lower cost um, from traditional methods, it shouldn't be overlooked. Also, when connecting actors in an ecosystem that involve development aid, uh, it does require a lot of coordination and collaboration, which can be costly. So having an upfront risk assessment of the technologies, the processes, the policies, legal, reputational, financial, operational, and other risks is really quite key. This risk assessment is complementary to the opportunities and benefits um, that would be there and an assessment done on that as well. There should also ideally be a governance framework applied in the research phase of blockchain adoption. And there are several out there with the main goals being looking at the governance on chain and off chain. Now, regulatory systems and professional standards in tax, audit, accounting, internal control, financial reporting um, would also need to be updated for the changes that blockchain brings. Legal standards for acceptance of digital signatures and IDs and viewing smart contracts as legally binding equal to paper contracts are also important challenges for legislation to catch up to the technology. So, but this absence of a regulatory position also offers opportunities uh, for management of organizations, um, the development world, standard setters, professional service providers also to work together and come up with some innovative solutions. The GDPR or EU privacy standards uh, do not refer to blockchain, but also clearly uh, blockchain has an impact on privacy and it will become more pronounced when we start having cross-border transactions where there are risks of terrorism financing and other risks which have to be mitigated and controlled. So one last item on the risk side I can speak to is, is the enormous amount of uh, electricity that public blockchains use currently in mining. Now it could um, derail our climate goals and I think the innovation to get us here is a first step. And now we need to continue to innovate, to find a way to not use as much electricity in the way we currently do for public mining. 
uh, but still achieve mining and consensus in that model. So it is a true challenge, but one that will need to be overcome. And uh, it, it's something that's not sustainable currently, but but they are, but I, I'm optimistic on this one. Now, fortunately, the problem doesn't affect private blockchain technology. So from these examples, the benefits and risks, we can see that the potential for scaling up these use cases of blockchain technology and in international development is clearly there. Also, the potential for collaboration and cooperation between development actors and the private sector is significant. But having a centralized coordinating area would be ideal and doesn't quite exist today in, in that realm. So we are relying a lot on individual organizations uh, who are leaders to offer their solutions to others and for others to, to join. So for the examples that use private blockchains, if we can solve or minimize the electricity use issue, there is also potential to eventually move towards a quasi public private blockchain model and eventually a fully public blockchain model. For example, one can mark a piece of work as needing consensus or mining, such as an actual moving of tokens, farm out that piece only for mining and validation. So different pieces of work could need higher or lower levels of security or speed, and thus higher or lower costs in paying for mining and validation. In this way, consensus actually becomes a commodity. So we pay more for more consensus, faster across more machines. So two people can validate between each other for free and no broader consensus is needed. Now, if a UN entity wishes to send $10 million of funds to an NGO to implement a project, then perhaps we want maximum consensus and are willing to pay uh, more, such as $500 or $1,000 for it. So this is the role and potential that public blockchains can play, which could dramatically decrease the cost of business and development. To conclude, I started the presentation speaking about the problem of poverty and worsening inequality. We are facing multiple crises with climate change and the current pandemic, and we do need to think differently to tackle the unprecedented challenges we face today. Blockchain technology will certainly not solve these problems, but it can go a long way to helping actors in the value chain to better collaborate, to add transparency through traceability, so aid funds uh, go to those that they are intended for without waste and in as fast a time as possible. There's about $2 trillion in development aid in the system, and it's very convoluted and inefficient now. With the many actors, with their own systems, their own requirements, and the potential of having these actors all operating and contributing to one or several secure blockchains would revolutionize development as we understand it and know it. Already there are good signs of cooperation and collaboration with 40 plus UN agencies pushing for a common approach on blockchain technology. Uh, the development finance institutions are doing the same. Now beyond blockchain, um, it can completely be used um, and its data collected on blockchains can be used to enable 3D printing, new technologies in artificial intelligence, robotics, digital security, and many other areas. I hope you found the session on reimagining international development on blockchain frameworks informative um, and leading uh, from the interesting presentations from yesterday, I'm sure you'll enjoy the next presentations. And with that, I'd like to hand back to you, Paul. Thank you so much. Advent, it's, it's Mark McDonald. Uh, I just wanted to thank you so much for the presentation here this morning. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm the, I'm the global lead partner for EY's public finance management space, including for uh, the public finance manager blockchain solution. And we're gonna see a demonstration of that right, right now. Advent, I think, it, I think it goes without saying that through the demonstration of your, of your commitment here this morning that you are a true leader and a true innovator when it, when it comes to this. And so uh, on behalf, I think, of the entire community, we just want to say thank you for that. Uh, you put a challenge here this morning and spoke about a $2 trillion ecosystem. And the quote that I wrote down is to, revol to, to revolutionize humanitarian development fully. Uh, and that really is the purpose of this. And so in the context as what Paul was saying earlier, 
we build and we commit uh, entirely to drive that sort of effect, that sort of benefit, um, and your leadership and that of your team uh, in, in committing to the application of blockchain to help to enhance that, uh, again, I think is, a, is, is the proper vision uh, and is also a demonstration of true leadership. So with that, uh, we'll go to break. Well, there'll be a bit of commentary. Uh, and then when we come back after the break, uh, there will be a technical demonstration of the tool that has helped to enable what uh, Advit has uh, presented with us here this morning. Hopefully you can see some some videos in addition to our pictures there. Although I think they look pretty accurate, right? <laughs> um, man, that was a lot to unpack in that in that presentation. It's really awesome things that are um, uh, that are going on in the world of, uh, of public finance. Um, uh, you know, I took a bunch of notes throughout that, but um, curious what some of your thoughts, uh, Kiriakos, were as, as as we start to look into this a bit more. Uh, thanks, James. Yeah, I think Advid did a good um, overview of why I think blockchain is exciting for the international development sector. And it was encouraging to see that went beyond the world of cryptocurrency, which is what uh, blockchain popular in the first place. I think the, the whole idea of disintermediation, of increased transparency, cost savings, um, that are enabled by using blockchain are super important, especially uh, for aid agencies that are trying to maximize uh, the impact that we have in the field. Um, so having uh, an ability to streamline the way we deliver assistance is critical at every step along the way. So I, I definitely think that blockchain, um, when scaled, can really enable um, our impact to be maximized in the field. Yeah, and, and to Mark's point at the end there, I mean, just imagine the the impact it's going to have when individual donors, contributors to these, can see where their where their funds are going, right? Can 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 uh, contract their donation to the to the farmer in Kenya who they're helping to support. I mean, it, it's just such an awesome concept that I feel like has always been there in humanitarian efforts, but but just gets lost in the system, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. I think that would be a good incentive. Uh, I, individual donations are still um, a lot lower than what they could be, especially for humanitarian relief. And that's an area that the World Food Program is trying to actively explore and increase. And I feel that um, individuals that could actually act where their funding is going directly to the, to the person that's receiving it would add an amazing uh, incentive to really increase the options. Um, yeah, you can see you can see your impact, right? And and knowing that it can get there quicker. To your to your point about the efficiency of this, you know, that, that's really what this is about: getting getting critical life saving aid to the people who need it when they need it, right? So often, people we we wind up donating in response to world events, and then it takes a long time to make an impact. Um, but yeah, I'm just, just just so excited to see systems like this start coming uh, start coming alive. And then the um, I really like how Avid bridged the gap between kind of the funding and the and sort of cryptocurrency ish way of doing things, but to real other like to other processes, to, to, to other assets, and, and, and the way that these things can flow. I think it was just such a neat uh, connection that he made uh, between uh, you know using blockchain for funds versus using blockchain for, for health records and for information and, and covered a lot of topics there. 
Yeah, and supply chain, which is another area that I think holds a lot of promise. Um, at least for the for the World Food Program, we are the uh, logistic lead uh, for any emergency response. So if we can streamline logistics and supply chains using blockchain, then that means we can deliver assistance more efficiently in a shorter amount of time. And then again, every time you increase efficiency, there are cost savings that are had, which then turn around and get reinvested into the yeah. programs that we have in the field. Yeah. Um, I also really like the idea of having a system where multiple agencies or actors can provide assistance directly to the same beneficiary. So that therefore it, it makes the beneficiary experience a lot simpler and, and they only need one wallet or one account that can then receive either cash assistance or health assistance or education assistance whatever the case may be. So yeah, that's a really good that, point. Making it yeah. making it easier to receive that aid, right, I think is going to be a, a, a place to increase focus. And security, too. We mentioned that on the on the call. I think this is going to come up through through some of the additional topics as well, too. There's a, a little bit of a difference between maybe losing your private key to a, to a Bitcoin wallet versus losing access to life-saving funds or, or medical records or, you know, um, so we have to be treating these things in, um, in, in, in slightly different ways, but it sounds like it's, they're making great progress on that. Absolutely. I, I think also my one, my, what I would like to see is the scalability of the different um, applications that Advid mentioned. Uh, increase exponentially. Um, I think we're making a lot of progress. Uh, so for example, the building block example that Advid talked about um, that the World Food Program has implemented, we started the pilot for that in 2016, late 2016. And it's now 2021 and we're reaching 1 million beneficiaries, which is great, right? That I, I don't want to undermine the success, but we currently serve 100 million people. So going from 1 million to 100 million needs to happen a lot faster than going from zero to one. And I, and I see that across different blockchain applications that it, it takes the scalability factor has yet to be um, figured out. Well, hopefully in some of the next uh, presentations here, we'll learn a bit more about scalability and, and some of the technical pieces behind it. I'm really looking forward to our next uh, set of presenters here. Likewise. Thank you, gents. Up next, we're going to be talking about tokenizing government programs and tracking results with Robert Chagutta and Devon. Morning, everyone. I'm Robert Judson. I'm hoping you can hear me, and we're all we're set to go. Uh, I have the great good fortune of uh, humbling, really, experience of, of following Advit's wonderful conversation and wonderful vision of um, of how blockchain can enable aid in development finance. And you know, we had we had posed a question. Of, I'm hoping folks can see my screen. And um, you know why this use case? Well, we just heard the answer for this use case. The passion that Advit brings, the work that the UN and the development community uh, is are doing in this area are, are extraordinary. Um, we, we, you know, when we came to this problem a number of years back, you know, we focused very much on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17. Advit spoke about food scarcity. Talked about the wonderful work that the World Food Program is doing. But if you take even step back from that, the larger you know, pathway for humanity for a better planet and a better future, what, what better greater good could, could this solution support? Uh, Adva talked about 150 billion annually, but you know, the World Bank, for example, deployed an additional 160 billion for COVID relief. So the sums of money are just simply extraordinary. And, 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 and Advit emphasized the importance of traceability and that donors and oversight groups are, are demanding due diligence, accountability, and, and safeguarding. And, and these are running up against inefficient in, uh, systems that were never designed uh, for this traceability. Uh, 
we'll we'll talk a bit about uh, you know there's a, a lot of, uh, of of funds are are actually lost through corruption and theft and 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 seven billion for example per year is money that could be used for the greater good to help beneficiaries. Um, the point I think that uh, 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 Kriakos just raised about collaboration. You know, the evolving aid frameworks and project funding are really becoming so much more complex. And finally, I think the thing that we've come to realize is that the projects, the development finance projects for which blockchain can be uh, uh, deployed are, 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 ve are very, very complex and, and, and they differ very much by countries. Um, so with blockchain, we're going to share with you in the next 30 or 45 minutes some details about how the collective capacity could be to achieve impact could be multiplied. And, and Devin and Shigupta will take you through and tracking not only funds, but also results. And uh, you'll see complex entity relationship networks for one single project, but there are thousands of projects being deployed by the UN, by the largest development banks, for the world's most vulnerable beneficiaries. We see the ability to enrich that. And finally, uh, as, as, as Advid mentioned, uh, the focus on, on the security aspects of it, the ability uh, to uh, have end-to-end -end traceability is something that will uh, ensure that all of the benefit that is being deployed will reach those who are most in need. So with that, um, I have the great pleasure of introducing uh, two folks who've been instrumental, Devin Yarbrough, who is the lead developer for the EFAD project, that, uh, that Advit just described. Um, and in addition, uh, Shigupta Sayani, who is EY's product manager for the public finance, for the EY Ops Chain Public Finance Manager, which is at the core of, 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 uh, of this solution. So with that, I'm going to um, unshare my screen and turn it back um, to Devin. Excellent. So thank you, Robert. Um, hopefully you guys can see my screen. Is that correct? Yes. Perfect. All right. So as Robert mentioned, um, I'll be walking through the IFAD use case. So we'll be talking about um, what did we do, how we did it, and why we did it. And then um, we'll be turning over to Shagufta to dive into the technical architecture of PFM. So to begin, we're taking the flow of funds from the donors to IFAD to borrowers and downstream, and we're putting them on the EY Ops Chain PFM. And this runs on the Ethereum blockchain network. And the reason why we're doing this is because it gives us additional benefits, like, for example, near real time uh, understanding of the flow of funds, as well as additional automated controls using smart contracts. And it also gives IFAD a better understanding of project metrics tied to the flow of funds. So quite a few benefits that we're seeing here. And um, I forgot to mention, hopefully we will have some time at the end for, uh, for some Q&A. So that's the what. Um, we'll talk about the, the why. Here you see the simplified flow of funds. So, we have the donors on the left giving funds to IFAD. Then we have funds going from IFAD to the borrowers. And the reason why I say that this is a simplified flow of funds is because sometimes you have quite a few steps after the borrowers and before the final beneficiaries. So in this case, we have borrowers, typically countries who are receiving funds, and then they send that down to intermediaries. And then finally, the funds reach the end beneficiary. So um, in this case, this would be a farmer who would then spend that, spend that money on livestock or seed um, and, and, uh, and help his farm. So in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the why, we have a lot of visibility into uh, the funds going from donors to IFAD and then from IFAD to borrowers. Um, so we have quite a bit of visi visibility there, but we start to lose visibility after it leaves the borrowers, goes to the intermediaries, and then goes to the beneficiaries. So most of that visibility is, um, is retroactive. So part of, part of this solution is making sure to have that near real-time visibility as the funds move 
um, from their day to day accounts. So um, next we'll talk about the how. Um, and this is where things get a little bit tricky technically, but we have and the reason being is because we have quite a few source systems that are holding all of the data that we just saw. Um, so we have the information coming in from donors to IFAD, the information coming from IFAD to the borrowers, and then all of the downstream source systems. So part of the how, and in the, in the very important part, is we don't want to go in and duplicate or replicate any existing systems. Um, and instead, we're taking the information that's already there and we are tracking it. So again, um, we have our donor information typically living within IFAD's environment that we're grabbing. We have our information of from IFAD to borrowers, so those transfers that we're, that we're receiving. And then we have all of our downstream information. So in, in some cases, this could be e-voucher programs, this could be um, source systems that are living within the various uh, government entities, or it could even be further downstream, uh, which is the beneficiary, in which case, as Advent mentioned earlier, um, we provide a mobile solution that will allow those beneficiaries to track funds and invoices. So quite a complicated uh, web, and we're actually gonna be taking a look at a few examples uh, from the system, the data that we've received, how we're tracking it, and we're gonna take a look at a few uh, additional features like the KPIs or the PDOs, so basically the project performance metrics, um, and, some, and then Shigufta will talk about some of the smart contracts and general architecture. So in terms of our progress today and our future, um, we have identified three source projects um, for this initial phase. And the three projects we're gonna be seeing in just a moment. And then we've, we're gonna be doing a deep dive into one project in particular, um, which is currently living in Kenya. And then we will be, um, like I had mentioned, uh, mapping out all of these source system information and continuing to do that as we go along. So for the Kenya project, we have the IFAD on the left. So we have the, um, the government of Kenya in the middle, which is receiving the bulk of funds. Um, we also recognize that in many cases, uh, this, for, this, for example, this project was $108 million. And in, in many cases, we're not just moving that you know, $108 million in a single transfer on the blockchain to Kenya. Um, it's actually divided based on donors and based on project components. So we'll be uh, taking a look at the breakdown of some of these flow of funds in just a second. So once the funds move uh, down to Kenya, they can mo then move downstream to various intermediaries and then finally, uh, all the way to the beneficiaries. So for example, the farmers or the farmer groups who are receiving these, these final funds. And actually, before I continue on, um, one additional piece to mention is that um, these graphs are actually made up of the underlying transfers within the blockchain network. Um, so when we start to look at the breakdown between accounts, that's really where we start to see from, from account to account to account. So here we have the, uh, what we consider the zoomed out view. So this is the overall project portfolio. Um, this could also be considered the donor view. So as a donor, um, if you want to see, you know, if your funds are going to uh, a certain project, you have that full visibility into not only which borrowers, borrowers are receiving the funds, but also which intermediaries, and then finally, which beneficiaries. So these are our three uh, key funds that we've selected for the project, with the Kenya being the, the deep dive. And as I mentioned before, in terms of divvying up by accounts, um, instead of having, as we saw earlier, the entity view, which is the tranche of funds going from IFAD to the borrower, we actually have um, these, these accounts divvied out based on components and donors. 
So um, this allows the donor uh, additional insight into, you know, if, if their funds are going to one farmer group within Kenya or the other, and insight into which uh, intermediaries their funds are actually flowing to. And uh, finally, we have the the end-to-end -end application. So we only have a, a very small taste of the uh, what's under the hood, but we have the ability to add additional entities to, like I said, um, track the various KPIs, as well as the, uh, or sorry, the, the PDOs, so the um, outcomes of each project, and also submit invoices, track purchase orders, and all sorts of things. But in the interest of time, um, I'm going to turn it over to Shagufta to really um, dive into what's going on under the hood for PFM. Thanks, Devin. Um, so now that you have learned about one of the implementations of the solution, it's time to dive deeper into um, understanding what the solution really is. Um, we will start by looking at the architectural pillars, um, understand how uh, we went about implementing it, um, look at the capabilities that are available out of the box and how they are implemented on the blockchain, uh, take a deeper, deeper dive on the technical architecture, and finally understand um, you know, where we are in the process and what does the ecosystem look like. Um, by the end of this masterclass, um, you will have a clear idea of how we can use blockchain uh, to tokenize government programs uh, and, and track results, hopefully. My name is Shagufta Sayani, and uh, I'm a manager in the EY blockchain practice. I'm based out of Toronto and have been contributing to this platform in one fashion or another for close to four years now. And uh, my blockchain journey uh, began, actually began in 2016 while I was working as a developer in India. And little did I know back then that one day it could lead me to be a part of something so impactful. Um, I, I was so moved by uh, Advit's presentation this morning. And just last week, my husband and I were watching the Indian news about how amidst the COVID crisis, 67 uh, brand new ventilators sent by the central government using the PM cares fund uh, are gathering dust in the storeroom of a named district hospital reason being the health authorities are embroiled in paperwork to shift uh, the equipment elsewhere and this is just one example of mismanagement um, and lack of transparency in funds disbursement. And today, as uh, governments are ramping up the pandemic uh, response spending to uh, unprecedented levels and they're shoveling it out the door with urgency and desperation, the risk of mismanagement and misappropriation has increased exponentially. And this is exactly why, why the solution is the need of the hour now more than ever, or um, you know, Adit correctly said, the GovTech. Um, so there's a wide variety of user segments that can benefit from the solution, uh, typically a financial management uh, function that is accountable for delivery of better governance and public outcomes and require continual, accurate and reliable reporting of financial um, as well as non-financial data to make um, effective strategic decisions. And um, it could be multiple levels of government, municipal, regional, provincial or federal, it could be at any level, or it could be international institutions that administer cross-jurisdictional uh, economic and social development assistance programs um, like World Bank Group or IMF or even just organizations and bodies that are accountable for emergency relief um, and you know, disaster recovery, research and academic grants, or um, large charity organizations that donate funds for achieving certain outcomes, but have limited avenues for visibility, um, you know, the Gates Foundation, for example. So from a financial management perspective, there are, uh, you know, these are some of the fundamental pillars, because when we talk about tracking money and monitoring funds, the focus uh, generally is on expenditure, you know, how am I spending uh, money and what is happening with it. But there's also an incoming revenue and, of course, a regulatory aspect to it as to how all of this is happening. Uh, direct delivery is when instead of transferring money to intermediaries and delivery agents, the government might be delivering services directly to the recipients. 
client applications really is the different kinds of use cases uh, it's going to support. And this is an initial view and it is evolving uh, with the market needs. We have implemented a loans and grants management use case, a shared services use case for a couple governments. Uh, we could uh, support transfer payments, capital projects, citizen, uh, citizen uh, services. And similarly, you could see multiple use cases arise because there's a perception of uh, what it could be and how much can be done on this platform. Form. But at the same time, this is a product that's not everything for everybody. So it has a focus on what you can actually do, which is why this matrix is so fundamental in making sure how this really flows down. Um, capabilities and infrastructure we'll cover in depth in the coming sections. Um, so Devin, if you could go to the next slide, please. When we started um, architecting the solution, the premise of the business problem uh, we were solving was that the central budget authorities or the parliaments that actually vote and create budgets, they set up these huge outlays uh, of funds uh, for different purposes to be spent under different programs. And between this high level allocation and budget determination to the local hospital in my neighborhood, there are like 40 different agencies involved in the fund aspects of the program and a huge, huge network of all of these agencies being involved in spending the money within their siloed systems. Uh, and from conversations we've had, uh, large governments have limited transparency and face a hard time getting insights into basically three things. Uh, what are they spending their money on? Uh, how is it being spent? What outcomes are being achieved out of it? And under current systems for governments to understand the outputs and outcomes that result from the money uh, they spent on certain programs, there is this long and complex process of asking different agencies to collect and report financial and non-financial information. Uh, and the only viable ins insight on this usually comes in six months to a year later. And it, it comes in at an aggregate level wherein reports roll up to reports and um, it is at a level where uh, it may or may not be useful uh, in terms of making decisions or tying outcomes to these outlays. And this affects their efficiency in core financial management uh, business processes, uh, be it budgeting, expenditure management, or performance management. So what we've recognized is uh, for effective decision making, governments need a single source of integrated financial and non-financial information provided continually uh, to support decision making. And, and that's where blockchain really comes into the picture. So what we've done is uh, we've tokenized funds and taken some of those programs, converted them into smart contracts to capture the conditions under which those funds should be spent. Uh, we've stylized different departments as participants or wallets who've got a stake in managing some of those contracts. And we've extended it to small works where uh, works can be given out centrally to a community of contractors. Um, and um, right now what we're doing is we're capturing work orders, purchase orders, and conditions on how they are being serviced. So all of the service level agreements which sit on top of those work orders are now connected down to the invoice level. Since the original appropriation itself is tokenized, the tokens are tracked as, as they are transferred, subdivided, and spent all the way down by the delivery agents in, in the network, which Devin just showed in the previous slides. Um, each time a token moves through the chain from a program devised by Ministry of Health, for example, to, deliver, uh, to a delivery agent to, let's say, deliver ventilators, where ventilators can be represented as non-fungible tokens and funds for procuring them as fungible tokens. And they can be reconciled and consolidated for financial reporting purposes and at the same time integrated with the information on the delivery agent's performance in terms of uh, how many ventilators have been delivered so far. So this allows government, uh, the governments to answer those three questions which we raised earlier. What am I spending my money on? How am I spending it? And what outcomes am I getting out of it in near real time? And this is where you start getting this different set of qualitative data because of all of the transparency and the right level of granularity as the money and assets move within the network. In terms of platform capabilities, we focused on building a set of modules that can support use cases listed in the previous slides and solve the challenges around disbursement traceability through complex networks and hierarchies. Um, the first module we started off was uh, uh, with was onboarding, 
which is key in defining the network governance and applying rules and permissions throughout the solution. We targeted the ability to support multiple persona logins, allow entities to set up their network of pays, set up programs, account structures, user groups and permissions. And uh, we created provisions to embed these hierarchies and their linkages at the smart contract level. And you know this kind of ensures the strict confidentiality and privacy across the solution. All of these capabilities within this module and some others as well uh, can be driven through the backend based on um, ingesting the seeding files, uh, which Devin was just talking about in the previous slides as a one-time setup activity, or could be done through a dashboard that allows network participants to do that on a more periodic basis and um, use PFM as the standalone solution if they wanted to. Um, and this dashboard is more than an admin activity per se, and it's kind of foundational to how a particular value system exists today and how we actually want to set it up on the network. The second uh, is configuration, which allows users to go in and configure fundamental building blocks, such as defining types of fund tokens. You could add some color to the fund tokens as well, where you, you, know, you can identify these are your capital expenses and these are your operating expenses. So your CapEx tokens, OPEX tokens, uh, you could execute initial budget allocations. You can set, it, you know, set up targets to measure performance outcomes and inventory management as well. Uh, performance management is another key feature of PFM that helps in tying the non-financial with the financial information. And we have implemented it using um, the very famous OKR or the object key result framework with aggregation capabilities across different entities or programs based on their weightage and hierarchy. Uh, once we have onboarded and configured the ecosystem, the third module we focus on is transaction management. Uh, this is kind of the crux of the solution where uh, we've deployed capabilities to support a wide variety of use cases, um, such as the first one, which you see loans and grants management, um, wherein we have constructs for entities to create funding requests uh, across complex hierarchies and networks using multiple different disbursement types and support different disbursement scenarios based on the arch type of the entity at the receiving end and tie the initial funding to the contract and project work items and performance outcomes for the holistic view of the ecosystem. Program funding is uh, where funds can be dispersed down the chain and be traced by interested parties. And we've added abilities to claw back, pause, and freeze funding based on certain conditions or milestones not being met. Um, asset maintenance, wherein physical assets are tokenized uh, and linked to their financial information, such as um, work orders, purchase orders, invoices, or direct uh, expenses incurred against it. And by doing that, you can now measure the performance of not only the entities, but also the assets within the network, which is so powerful. Procurement is where procurement of any kind of capital or services would have the need to be tracked to understand what's happening with the money uh, that was spent. So we have the ability to create work orders, purchase orders, uh, invoices, and tie them to programs, funding contra uh, contracts, or assets, or withdrawal requests in order to close the entire disbursement traceability chain. Performance and expense reporting is where suppliers can use our low-touch mobile-based solution, which Adwit was, uh, you know, has mentioned, uh, was used by the farmers in the IFAD implementation to submit receipts and invoices and related documents. And the web app can be used uh, to report on performance development objectives. Analytics and reporting are another critical piece to tie the entire end-to-end -end funds dis uh, disbursement traceability flow. And currently in PFM, it is done using uh, a Sankey diagram, which you've seen in Devin's presentation a few slides ago. And a collection of transaction tables uh, with interactive capabilities to drill down on detailed information on individual transactions. So, um, in future, we do have plans of applying advanced analytics and um, machine learning models to all of this rich data that we get from the blockchain. In terms of audit, the controls framework is essentially embedded within the smart contracts in a way that defines how the, spun, the, the funding is spent. And currently, the audit function is one of the user personas uh, with viewing capabilities on the existing platform. Um, but 
in future, we may be able to plug in an auditor specific controls that can provide them uh, a dashboard of whether all these transactions that are happening on the blockchain is actually compliant with their controls or not. So it could be something that's more insightful for auditors um, and or clients in general. If you go to the next slide, so we've taken a very sensible approach to building a scalable blockchain solution, and uh, you will be able to appreciate that by the end of this section. Um, technically, PFM is built in a way that currently it is architecturally decentralized and logically and politically centralized. Because with the governments, we need to be able to respect or comply with their data residency and data privacy requirements that each jurisdiction has. Uh, but from a longer term perspective, uh, we need to be able to comply with the public blockchain data infrastructure and our ZKP and baseline efforts um, in, in order to full, you know, achieve the full potential of blockchains. So those are kind of the two uh, principles amongst others that were consistently followed while building this. If you start with the user layer from the top right corner, that is our PFM interaction service uh, layer, wherein we have a configurable white label UI, which is more of a template with all the available PFM functionalities. And depending on the use case being implemented, whether you want to track assets or you want to be tracking budgets and funding programs, you can pick and choose the screens you need. Um, and similar to blockchain.ty.com, if you saw Isabella's uh, presentation yesterday, we have localization for PFM as well, which essentially means we can support multiple languages um, as long as you provide the translation file for the client implementation, which is very highly configurable. On the top left, there is a representation for external enterprise systems because most participants uh, have their own standalone systems, as we even saw in case of IFAD. So there could be active directories that define their organization structure or ERPs and oracles, which would be connected if we need to get a complete picture of the day to day business transactions of different parties within the network. Next up, we have the access control layer, um, which directly relates to one of the risks Advit highlighted around privacy and was also one of the biggest challenges to solve uh, for us because we are setting up permissions not just for one organization, but for a network of organizations. And this network has a strong hierarchical structure set that uh, a hierarchical structure um, such that within the hierarchy, we need to ensure that entities on the level below cannot see or execute on any information that's up the hierarchy. So we have uh, a combination of Auth0 managing the authentication, uh, Azure Key Vault managing the keys, and a fairly granular blockchain directory smart contract service managing the access and permissions to information and resources on chain as well as off chain. Um, we store most of our, uh, you know, most of the relevant data that would be subject to privacy in our off chain database, which you can see uh, down here at the infrastructure layer and, you know, just the reference on the blockchain in order to protect against uh, privacy and the access to the off chain storage as well flows on the uh, flows through the permissions on chain that's managed by the same directory smart contract. Data orchestration is required in order to ingest transactions from these external systems. Uh, this layer comprises of a drop zone wherein files from the external systems arrive periodically, which then goes through the service layer that contains the mapping files in order to validate and harmonize data before uh, sending it to the API for processing. One advancement, however, uh, we are doing in this area as we speak is, so previously we've uh, had a simple sequential processing of um, these files, but as we are moving into production, we are recognizing that we need a queuing and transaction management mechanism to allow us to, uh, you know, first of all, process uh, ingested, uh, ingested transactions in sequence. And second, to also track whether transactions have been successful or not. Because if one transaction fails, there may be a whole bunch of other transactions dependent on that one that shouldn't be processed. So that's that's why we are uh, introducing Kafka into our architecture, which will play multiple roles as a transaction manager, um, as well as the queue for our data orchestration layer. 
API uh, is a key element of PFM that essentially uh, provides endpoints for the entire app. Uh, we have a combination of RESTful web services and a GraphQL Apollo server, which provides a lot of flexibility in serving data to the UI and, and to a large extent has allowed us to get multiple prototypes uh, up and running quickly, where um, you know we've had to modify the UI or where the specific prototypes needed custom screens. Um, the materialized reuse really helped us generate reporting, analytics, and complicated uh, queries effectively. In event management, we have an event listener that listens to all the events on the blockchain, uh, which we then use to generate most of our reporting and analytics queries. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the recent addition of uh, Zookeeper in conjunction with Kafka and Postgres for handling transaction management may eventually be extended to capture events too in the future. Uh, with regards to smart contracts, uh, we have a very robust set of contract architecture that supports member onboarding, funding and disbursement, procurement and maintenance, and the overall workflow and analytics. We have implemented ERC-1155, the multi-token standard for tokenizing funds and assets. 1155 is a standard interface for uh, contracts that manage multiple token types wherein a single deployed contract may include any combination of um, fungible as well as non-fungible tokens. Uh, we previously had ERC-20 and ERC-721, but they require separate contracts to be deployed for each token type, uh, placing a lot of redundant bytecode in the blockchain and limiting functionality by nature um, you know, of separating each token contract into its own permission address. Um, and we always kept running into gas issues with that. So this is another recent development in the product which has helped us save on transaction costs and uh, do some optimizations. Some other smart contracts we have are, are uh, there are three, basically there are three abstractions in PFM, assets, funding contracts, and entities. Entities are like legal entities such as a ministry or a project implementation unit, and they may be running multiple programs, uh, which is through the funding contracts. And those funding contracts can be of uh, can be one of three types. It could be a traditional budget program, you know, where the central budget authority maybe is allocating a budget, or they could be of type uh, loans or grants, wherein uh, it's a bit more formal, withdrawn on mechanisms built into the smart contracts to uh, to to request the withdrawal uh, under those programs. So that's. That's there. And then we have the works related smart contracts as well uh, for work orders, purchase orders, uh, service agreements and invoices. And they are supported by a bunch of monitor contracts. Um, we have implemented a facade pattern, which is a commonly used object oriented design pattern in which a facade serves as um, you know, a front facing interface masking any kind of underlying complex logic. So we have built these monitors that act as facades providing us a lot of modularity um, we have a budget monitor, we have an expense monitor, procurement monitor, and similarly, if we were to add, let's say, a credit module in future, we could easily extend the smart contract functionality and add a credit monitor. Uh, on the infrastructure layer, we have a Mongo database instance for each implementation for the off-chain storage, which contains all the non-transactional metadata related to those uh, three abstractions, which I just mentioned. Uh, we also have data related to the work orders, purchase orders, service agreements, and invoices uh, stored in the database. And other than that, we also have the events that are generated on the blockchain captured by the event listener, which are being stored uh, in, in, in the MongoDB right now. However, we are moving uh, from Mongo to a Postgres as most of our uh, as most of our data is re uh, relational in nature, and with the introduction of Kafka, we will redirect uh, events to Postgres since we generate most of our queries by querying the events. So we'll probably be doing some materialized views to those events table and simplify and optimize some of our existing uh, queries as well. With regards to blockchain, we have a private POA permission set of Geth Ethereum nodes, uh, which we deploy into our Azure infrastructure and um, we use Kubernetes. And that pretty much summarizes the technical um, architecture for PFM. And now that we've invested 
a lot of time in understanding the technical details of the underlying architecture. I think it's important to understand why does any of it matter? And, uh, you know, it kind of goes back to the point um, Kenya Cross raised in his debrief about scalability. So this slide here kind of summarizes how we are building, um, building out our implementations. Um, you've heard and seen all about the, you know, what we're doing with IFAD, and you've seen the demonstration of PFM and blockchain, and, um, you know, there's pictures of the Sankey dashboard right there that Robert and Devin talked about. So with IFAD and even with other implementations as well, what we are doing right now is creating standalone proof of concepts for initial projects. Um, and the biggest challenge that we are looking at is how do we do a pilot um, where we integrate with actual systems, onboard more entities, and address scale up. So if you look at the box on the right hand corner, you'll see some outcomes we are looking at achieving you know, from our pilots that we're doing. Uh, what's driving this is that each of these entities that we are working with has prototyped two or three individual projects. But these entities have thousands of projects, as, um, as Robert mentioned in his in intro as well, which are running globally in disparate systems. So the immediate first, uh, first challenge uh, is around integrations. And uh, that matters because the ERP system, for example, in Kenya may be very different from the one in Colombia. And for this use case, it matters significantly because there may be mobile payments made through a payment provider in one country uh, that isn't allowable in another. And we have to have an architecture and APIs that re are responsive to the myriad of different projects and their requirements. And it's not like we don't have those today. We absolutely have designed with this in mind. And that's where we see uh, you know, us spending the next six months at identifying integrations with other key systems like KYC, financial reporting, risk systems, um, flex cubes and oracles, which you could see in Devon's slide as well. And the second big question is obviously around scaling. So how much transaction activity can be handled uh, on the blockchain? How can we reduce the transaction size and on-chain uh, on storage? Our hosting consensus and deployment architect uh, architecture, all of this kind of needs to support our scaling requirements. And this is exactly why it was so important to delve upon all our design decisions uh, that we covered in the previous slide, uh, be it around the smart contract standards that we've implemented or the design patterns that we've implemented to, uh, <clears throat> to reduce the gas required and, and you know the introduction of Kafka and Postgres into the mix uh, to achieve better system turnaround time. Uh, with that, we are coming towards the end of the session, but before we close, I would like to hand it over back to Robert to leave us with the vision we have for PFM uh, and the, in the ecosystem of uh, converging set of market and government needs, which will sort of be the blueprint for answering the scaling question we just raised. Um, so over to you, Robert. Thank you, Shagufta. Um, that, 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 was, uh, that was great. And Devin, thank you. Maybe a couple of questions that I could direct to you guys. And then you guys could share some additional information before we get to our final couple of slides. Um, a question came up about, um, does the solution for development finance use ERC-20 and ERC-721 token standards? Can you talk a, a bit about that? Definitely, um, I can take that question. So uh, it actually uses both. So the, the core, um, funding that you actually saw through the Sankey diagram earlier is using ERC-20 tokens, um, which we consider a fungible token. And then uh, depending on the other asset types in the system, um, so for example, there is a capability to track assets such as tractors, um, then anything that is non-fungible, that's where we use the ERC-721 token. So we use a combination of both and it's important to stick with the standards um, because they're vetted by the blockchain community. Shagufta, anything you wanna add, add there? Nope, it's perfect. 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 Um, maybe a second question. And I think Shagufta, you alluded to this, I think in your, in your, in your closing comments, are, are there you know, particular geographies or, um, uh, uh, if you will, uh, um, country types of configurations uh, where this may be more relevant uh, for, for the shape of this solution? Or 
you know, it, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking out loud about, about the specifics of the Kenya project that, that Advid shared and, and that Devin talked about for, for, for Kenya, where the, the back end of that solution was a fairly sophisticated uh, e-voucher system, which involved the, the integration amongst a number of participants at the far side of the, of the network. But, but is it specifically just for that? Or, or can you say a little bit more about the particular project uh, details that may, be, uh, that may be good fits for this solution? Definitely. I can actually talk about the IFAD piece and then um, pass it over to Shigupta to talk about the other PFM implementations that might change based on the geographical region. Um, but Robert, as you mentioned, that's, that's exactly correct. Um, depending on the project location, um, some countries have more substantial software foundations and platforms in place to uh, give us some of that source system information so that we can then track those funds downstream. Um, so exactly right, Robert, with the e-voucher platform in place, we're actually able to uh, utilize that in order to visualize the flow of funds more effectively than some other countries where there aren't quite as um, fully fledged out platforms uh, downstream in order to track those funds. Sometimes it's, um, sometimes it's necessary to use the mobile application and um, also, you know, uh, cater the solution around what information we do have available. Um, but over to you, Shagufta, because I know there's, there's um, quite a variety of uses for PFM beyond, um, beyond that. So any additional um, comments there? There are, and uh, I, I would beg to differ a little bit uh, from you, Devin. Of course, having some, <laughs> having some sophisticated systems is helpful, but at the same time, when there are no systems, it's easier. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't have to really build into a lot of integration points and you don't have to sit and harmonize a lot of data across all of those systems and perform a lot of cleanup. So I, I don't think so that, you know, this capability is restricted to countries or geographies which have sophisticated systems or processes in place right now, because I obviously cannot, I cannot name some of these implementations that we are doing, but they are happening in countries and cities where they just have uh, the internet and a web browser and nothing more than that. And PFM is, you know, being, it's, it's considered to be used as the standalone solution. So definitely I, I would um, say that it, it extends to a lot of geographies and it does not require any kind of sophisticated uh, infrastructure. Definitely. No, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, and uh, I think the important piece is, is it, can actually support both. So if there's something in place, we can take that information, but if there's nothing there, then we have options available as well. Yeah. Devin, maybe I'll pick up on that and ask you and Shigufta um, about, uh, and I think Advit alluded to it, but maybe we could say a little bit more about how the blockchain might enhance supervision. And, and what I mean by that is that not only the, uh, the traceability of fund flows through an, a complex project web and, and account structures, uh, but also um, um, how uh, some clients are thinking about at the far end of the, at the blockchain is using, uh, using that to potentially post evidence of, 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 of progress toward the results which the funds were initially intended. Definitely. So um, in that in that example, and, and this is actually where um, this solution really shines is um, instead of with uh, some of the existing use cases we see instead of having uh, individuals on the ground who are confirming that uh, farms are being created livestock is being bought schoolhouses are being built. Um, instead of having people deployed out there to um, verify, you could actually potentially allow beneficiaries to take a picture of the schoolhouse and take a picture of the farms and the livestock and upload that and um, verify it themselves. So you allow them uh, the ability to kind of self-verify and self-govern -govern, um, the, the progress of these projects instead of um, going back and, and verifying um, our, ourselves. So 
definitely. I see how that um, that additional capability and um, obviously I, there are some downsides to uh, allowing that to happen. Um, some of the downsides being, of course, you, you're going to always have your bad actors in the system, but I think allowing uh, individuals the power to do that is is really important. Yeah, and it kind of goes goes back to the point that Krikos has uh, raised in his debrief also around the user experience for these end users and beneficiaries as well, right? So they can work with multiple entities now within this network without having to be represented in multiple different places. So uh, I think I agree with there's a lot of uh, advantage and the the risk that Devin highlighted of bad actors, it can be controlled to a certain extent, like, uh, you know, the way we have the mobile app. Um, so it is for, uh, you know, participants in the network, which, which do not need to be onboarded completely onto the system. They do not need to see everything that's going on. And the sole purpose that they have on the network is to provide invoices or to, or to submit receipts. So they're at like at the leaf level, down at the leaf level. And what they can do is they can just onboard using this low touch mobile app. And they don't really need to have a user persona or a user login on the actual web app. So that's how you can control, uh, you know, the amount of information that they see, they have access to, or they can execute on. I think that, that that that's excellent. That's very helpful. Um, maybe maybe uh, we did. I see, I'm looking at some questions and and maybe a quick comment from both of you uh, around um, the current solution. We are currently um, uh, linking the current uh, sort of uh, disbursement traceability blockchain, but we're not. Uh, we're using the initial the, the the existing financial rails, if you will, to actually move. The, the funds. I wonder if we could maybe say a few words about, about how that's done uh, through smart contract logic um, and then um, and, and, and how we envision um, rolling that out initially. Definitely. So um, it's, it's a multi-phase approach. So you have phase one, which is um, taking, like we mentioned, the existing, existing source system information and all of the transfers that are going uh, that are happening between bank accounts to bank accounts um, and kind of mirroring that in the blockchain which is the first phase but as you can imagine um, we ideally should be moving towards a, um, a single source of truth within the blockchain itself so instead of mirroring the transactions that are happening um, perhaps using a stable coin that would then allow those transactions to occur and be um, the single system that's tracking those. So um, I know there's a, a lot of potential there, but the journey to go from phase one to phase two, as you can imagine, um, encouraging all of these entities to um, put aside their traditional banking systems and, and bank accounts and, and moving to a blockchain-based approach can be um, pretty daunting, but, but uh, we're confident that might not be next year, might not be the year after, but five, 10 years down the road, we'll, we'll eventually move towards the phase two version. Um, that's, that's great. I mean, I would just add a few points to what Devin mentioned. And when we think of BFM, we think of it as building a common good or a blockchain utility. And then thinking about all the players within the ecosystem who we have relationships with, who um, we are in the process of building this out with. Uh, so, you know, you can think of uh, as PFM in the center and on the right, we have alliances, our alliances with the IT firms. Uh, then we've, we're having conversations with communities or pro uh, providers who do the last mile. Um, we're connected with the PAFI, which is a payment aspects of financial inclusion task force that comprehensively examines how payment systems and services affect financial inclusion effort. Um, and then we also have, you know, we're, we're we're starting to explore how PFM can link itself to the financial rails, um, as Devin just explained, and we're having conversations with some of the largest global financial institutions and banks about uh, how we can follow first in rails and then move to triggering payments in the actual financial systems, and then eventually use exchange of value directly so that, you know, that kind of, it facilitates the entire end-to-end -end flow. 
and on on the other side you could uh, you could vision you know the donors your trust funds and ngos and um, multinational uh, multilaterals and un agencies like ifad and um, you know governments organizations of economic uh, cooperation and development and other border wars and implementing agencies and so so what we're starting to see is it like a solution center here which utilizes all of these relationships but also can be used for multiple applications um it just just to give it a little bit of perspective in 2019 uh, general government spending for public financial management uh, in the us represented 38% of the us gdp and of you know the approximate 8 trillion spent in in public sector in the us 1.2 trillion dollars is the total administrative uh, administrative cost related to managing public uh, budgets and that's kind of the addressable market that we are looking at here for for this particular now this this is not the amount that anybody would be spending on this solution but this is the kind of efficiency gains that we are looking at so yeah i i think that that that's great you goofed i i don't know if the last slide was up when you were talking i I'm, i'm not seeing it but maybe we'll take a moment and maybe flash that last slide to to reemphasize i think um just how uh, the the collaboration and 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 the opportunities present here i think um you know um one of the things that i think has become evident to us is um the, the 30 largest donors the high income countries their network of trust funds partnerships and ngos in the far left you know um so much of their funds flow through um the this the second piece the largest multilateral development organizations and and efad and the un which which advit described so so powerfully in uh, in his introduction um you know the the governments there's 180 plus governments uh through which these largest multilateral development banks and and agencies uh deliver through and so the conduit gets kind of tight uh through 180 countries and they, and as we and we've talked about they have differing capabilities uh some are extremely advanced like Estonia some less so and and I think it's worth noting that many uh many of the most needy beneficiaries are are in places that are the most fragile and so the largest multi development banks uh are moving uh I would say cautiously through this because the borrowing countries um you know have uh local issues related to you know currency stability for example and so they they want to make sure that they can enhance the the disbursement traceability but not be disruptive with regard to other aims that they have about the financial stability and uh, standing up capital markets etc um the the piece that you gave to mentioned on the far right the largest global financial institutions i mean you know there's you know dozens of articles of late of significant presences uh, uh with regard to cross border support payment support remittances and there'll be opportunities certainly to, to for the for the actors on on the left the stakeholders on the left to to work closely with those on the right um both at the large global financial institution level and at the and at closer to the ground uh with regard to fintech partners and communities of interest around um mobile payments in particular um and and finally this all enabled by so those these are our our partners that we've heard so ably from in the last few days so i think this 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 brings us home for what um this masterclass um was designed to to share um there's a lot more detail and, uh, and more complexity and and we're embarking on this journey with with visionaries like Advid and um folks like him in these in these organizations and and we're delighted to have taken the time and have you sh- um shared with us um this this class so with with that Wasim I think I'm going to I don't know if I turn it over back to you or to James Yeah, and thank you Robert. Thank you Shagufta. Um and now we'll uh we'll actually have a short break with some commentary. So, thank you. Thank you Devin. Thank you. Thanks team.
All right, that was a boy. What a what a great what a great presentation. I'm still decompressing like all the amount of information that came in through that. I just think it was so. Uh, tell that James. <laughs> it was just really awesome. I, I, there was there was no doubt in my mind, Kirk, because when we were looking at the architecture diagram, that this was in fact a master class. <laughs> I, I think I might need to go back for like the undergraduate version <laughs> for some of this. Um, boy, what a what an incredible amount of detail. I think, um, you know, it's just so awesome to see how the architecture is starting to come together and, and, and some of the points that just jumped out at me, like this, this codifying the business rules and smart contracts before the funding's actually dispersed. It's just like, man, it makes a lot of sense uh, to see some of these uh, solutions. Yeah, and I think the, the smart contract is a, a point that struck me because it expedites the disbursement of assistance, right? So you could imagine if you're dealing with farmers and you have a scheme that is linked to index-based in insurance, you could uh, program that in directly. So if there's a storm or a drought or whatever your index is, you could disperse funds automatically without having um, any administrative delays. So I, I do like that aspect of the smart contract quite a bit. Yeah. And, and, and just the, the visibility that it kind of comes into, I mean, I, I almost think you could think of this as like putting the public back in public finance, right? It's, uh, we, we question sometimes, do you need a, do you need a blockchain to fix this, to do this solution? Right. But the accountability and transparency that it holds, I think, I think is a big piece of that question or a big piece of that answer. I was impressed by how many actors, um, the EY and, and EFAD were able to bring on board. Um, I, I think that's sort of the, the the biggest hurdle or one of the biggest hurdles, you know, despite all the, the, the technical um, aspects that we just heard about, which were amazing, but just getting different stakeholders to agree on a new form of data sharing, right? That is decentralized, that is not controlled, and that is inherently trusted by everyone as a new normal of sharing data, I think is, is is an aspect of implementing blockchain that I think is sometimes underestimated. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and, and following with that line of thought, right, this idea of tying the performance management with the finance management. I mean, I think I think Devin sort of summed that up sort of nicely in the Q and A uh, session, and you know, so good to laid out the architecture for that um, the, when we were looking in the in the details there, but. It's just such a neat thing, right? To, to, to be able to prove that we were doing what we said we were going to do. Simple concept, but it takes really fascinating technology to make that work at scale. Yeah, and I think scale is a piece um, that I found also illuminating is because it's designed for scale or at least the way that it was presented. So I, I think having that in mind um, from the very beginning of the, the design point is critical. Uh, although Shagufta did mention that depending on the country where it's being implemented, you might have to have other considerations taken into account. For example, when she was comparing Kenya to Colombia, right? If the payment system being utilized is completely different, then you have to think about how you can add additional modalities to it. But it does seem to me that the architecture is um, engineered from the outset to be scalable, or at least that's something that is, is one of the key design parameters of, yeah. of the PFM. And, and I think the use cases will just keep rolling in, right? I look at this sometimes as um, uh, a foundational technology. Actually, I think maybe it was Devin that, that called it a, a public utility, right? And that's a core, it's a basic a basis that we can start to start to put other things on top of that, that all sort of tie together. I think it was, you know, Need to be able to go from the, the high level use cases right down to the token standards and, and, and the considerations of, of creating these things was, um, was pretty cool. Yes, absolutely. I, I definitely, I do wonder, however, um, and, and maybe this is something that we can comment on on the next uh, round, um, is this level of technical uh, depth um, available to, to smaller organizations? So I think, you know, what UI has presented in EFAT is, is extraordinary. But and, and that's the challenge that we see across the board. Uh, finding the blockchain talent is 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 quite a limiting factor in being able to to bring in additional applications and additional use cases. Um, so I, I, I do um, wonder, uh, you know, how we can 
if I will democratize this amazing skill set and allow um, organizations that are much smaller to also capitalize on on this new um, technological area. Yeah, which is a you know that's an excellent point, and um, you know, and I do think we heard a bit yesterday um, in in the commentary and in the and in some of Paul's comments just around the importance of the open source nature of this type of work, right? And being part of that community that's helping to build those solutions that everyone will use sort of sort of raises a tie for everyone. Um, just such a such a cool cool example. I had never really digested all the humanitarian impacts of something like public finance management um, and to see some of this in action has just been uh, very exciting. Yeah, it, de it, de it definitely has been and I'm, I'm really excited to see what is coming next. Cool. All right. I think we are uh, about to roll on to the next set of speakers. Uh, so talk to you in a little bit, I guess. Talk to you soon, James. All right, up next we have designing tokens for supply chain assets. Uh, discussion with Rafael Pierre, Giuseppe Perone, Federico Dopoli, and Federico Sanella. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Wasin, and uh, welcome to the third uh, session, uh, third masterclass of uh, this day named uh, uh, Design Tokens for Supply Chain Assets. Uh, we have seen how tokens can help uh, government tracking uh, public funds uh, expenditures. Now we are going to see how we could leverage uh, tokens for real production use cases and projects in the supply chain industry. As you are, we are really proud to be the tech provider of Birra Peroni to create non-fungible uh, tokens from the traceability of their supply chain. Uh, we have realized and released uh, in the last weeks uh, this project uh, uh, based on Ethereum public blockchain and uh, uh, leveraging on EY of chain traceability. Vida Peroni uh, has launched the, this innovative service and scanning the QR code on the bottle is possible to see the tokens registered on blockchain for each batch of beer uh, produced. Let me introduce uh, Mr. Federico Sannella, Head of Corporate Affairs of Vita Peroni, that uh, will tell us uh, uh, of this important project uh, that is also, and uh, let me highlight this aspect, uh, an important example of uh, disruption and uh, innovation, uh, thanks to a collaboration between uh, a corporate like Peroni, the Italian startup that is the promoter of traceability processes in terms of storytelling and uh, web contents, and EY as tech provider uh, for uh, off-chain traceability. Thanks, uh, Federico, to join uh, our session, our master clan, uh, our master class. The floor uh, is yours. Thank you very much, Giuseppe, and hi to everybody. And thank you for this opportunity to showcase um, a project that, in fact, I have a lot in my heart because it started with an idea, uh, in fact, maybe with a dream. Uh, and then uh, after a while, it became more and more tangible, practical, and it came out with now we are on shelf with a, a bottle of beer uh, and the first time tracked with, uh, with the blockchain technology. So um, just a few words maybe uh, before, because not everybody knows Bira Peroni. Um, just, so just a few words. Bira Peroni is um, a company that has more than 175 years. So we're quite old, let's say. So being innovative has been also a challenge for us in this sense. We belong to uh, Azai Group Holding, a, a Japanese multinational. And in Italy, we operate in, uh, with three breweries, one in Padova in the north, another one in Bari in the south of Italy, and another one in Rome, where we have our headquarters. Um, so we are well distributed north, central, and south of the country. And we have a malting company in Pomezia that is 50 kilometers from Rome. Uh, this has been one of the elements that made us come to our mind that we could start working with our value chain, because having a malton company in the past years made us have a very strong relationship 
with our barley producers, so with the farmers. We have a relationship with more than 1,500 farmers in Italy that produce barley for us that, that we then transform in malt in our malting company and we then produce beer. Overall, Birra Peroni produces more than 6 million hectoliters of beer. We export two of them. Um, but let's say our core business is uh, in Italy with the brand Peroni on which we did this project. And as Giuseppe said, it came out through the partnership of uh, Startup Posti Italian and with uh, EY. Um, just uh, moving a bit on what was the idea. We um, in Birra Peroni, through our malting company, we produce a seed that we then provide to our farmers. Our farmers grow the barley during the course of the year. This barley then goes back to the malting company that transforms it into malt, that then goes to the breweries. And of course, it comes out a wonderful product that is our beer. And that then goes to the consumers. We wanted to track and um, have a clear uh, tracking of uh, all the production process with all the steps. This is why we asked EY and Posti to um, understand how we could use blockchain to track all the steps and to ensure that we have a full understanding of the value chain. Today we have on the bottle, as uh, Giuseppe said, a QR code in which we can, um, the consumer can experience exactly all the production process and have and receive information. We have, I think, a short video that can go on the background to show you exactly how it works. Uh, because the consumers buy uh, with uh, their iPhone, with their phone, can see exactly how this works. So they have all the information about the farm, where the barley has been produced, when, and everything, of course, is tracked through the blockchain technology. Um, this is uh, has different elements of, uh, uh, of information because there is a side of this information that is very technical, and this is provided by the platform, and uh, a consumer experience that is very engaging because in this platform, we can really tell a story and engage our consumers and bring them in a new experience. I have to say that um, if, I don't know, COVID is not good in any case, but uh, if there's something that COVID brought a bit uh, uh, as positive element has been the use of QR codes. Uh, we uh, were used to see in the menus with the QR codes, not to touch them to prevent diseases um, and uh, of course the online shopping experience and that at least in Italy was not that relevant just before the pandemic. Um, so um, we are now on shelf with this technology. Consumers are using it and this is already a good piece, bit, um, let's say piece of information. We were quite worried about this but consumers are engaging with it are using it and experiencing uh, this kind uh, of platform. Um, I would like to underline therefore why we did it and, and, and which are the benefits that we see around this, uh, um, this technology and which were the issues that we were trying eventually to solve. The first one is related to the quality of raw materials and the uh, quality of ingredients. Um, by tracking a supply chain and the origin of our raw materials, we can tell the story. First, of, co of course, we can monitor the quality of the raw materials because we know exactly where they come from and how the, our uh, farmers grew them. But this is also a very relevant story for our consumers that need to be more and more aware of the quality of our raw materials and be uh, fully involved in this. We uh, are Italians, uh, we all know this. We are fans of food. We are crazy for food. We wanna know everything about food. It's our tradition, it's, our, uh, it's one of the key elements of our economy. So 
having a full tracking, understanding, uh, and uh, quality perception uh, of our raw materials was one of the key elements that we wanted to achieve. The second one was related to uh, the fact of being Italian. So Italian uh, made in Italy, this credential is fundamental for our consumers. And uh, uh, the full tracking uh, and the reinsurance that the tracking is made through blockchain allows us to really uh, tell the story of an Italian company that uses Italian raw materials, that had a strong partnership with Italian farmers, and this has a very big and relevant value for consumers. Um, and this information is the third pillar, that is about providing consumer information. So track data that can be delivered to consumers. They are today more and more willing to better understand and exactly know what is behind the product. Um, another benefit is, uh, uh, but this will also be something that we'll need to look further in the future, is around sustainability. Because uh, if you track uh, your product, you can also start talking about sustainability of that product. Without tracking, without understanding where your raw materials are coming from, um, it's very difficult then to understand if these raw materials have been uh, cultivated and produced in the right way, following the right principles, and eventually um, with the right approach. And finally, innovation. Um, can you still, uh, yeah, and finally, uh, sorry, I thought I had a bad connection. Uh, and finally, innovation. For a company that is 175 years old, um, em embracing a, a project such as traceability and blockchain, putting this on the label is somehow revolutionary. We're one of the first brands uh, in the food sector that did this in this country. For sure, we are the first ones in beer. Uh, so for us, this has been really a message of innovation and future um, uh, and future vision, I would call it. Really a future vision uh, moving in this direction. Talking about future, um, what is the challenge in front of us? Uh, and, and I think which are uh, the next steps of all this project? Uh, for sure, we have um, this increasing demand of transparency from consumers. And this project, I, I believe, will be the first step because we will need then to add, as you have seen um, in the slides before, we are tracking just uh, a part of, a, of our value chain. We will need to go end to end in the process in the future to pro provide more and more transparency to our consumers. And of course, having reporting and being able to then better understand how much this sustainability element goes in, uh, uh, in our product. Let me try to explain me, myself better in this. Uh, we will need to be ready to tell to our consumers in the next future that not only our barley has been grown in a certain part in a field near Rome by that farmer in that date, but we'll also need to tell the consumers that that farmer used a certain technology, used trucks that have polluted or reduced pollution by a certain amount. And this we strongly believe that will be that kind of information that we'll need to include in the next future in the storytelling and therefore included in the traceability through blockchain process. Uh, of course, this is a challenge, but the challenge will uh, be um, feasible, let's say we'll be able to um, make it only if we'll be able to um, increase the number of players and partners that will participate in this journey with us. Because uh, to receive this kind of information and put them all together, we'll need to look at precision farming technology that will then be able to input in the system uh, all the data coming from the farms. Uh, we'll need to then be able to involve players in the logistics 
in order to uh, better understand the uh, exact life cycle assessment of our product end to end, as I said, uh, towards the consumer. And finally, I believe that the QR code that you have seen this short video just to give you, it's just at the beginning of a journey of engagement with consumers because consumers will be able in the next future to use these uh, uh, this um, as a gamification tool eventually to see promotions, participate. And of course, all this technology will need to, to be thought and um, used to support the final consumer experience and of course, sales, because at the end we are a business and this goes back to making more and more our product relevant to consumers and winning in the marketplace. Um, so I think it's a first step. I hope I have been able to provide you with, um, a, 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 in a short way, uh, a bit the idea of the project behind. It has been a great experience, great learning experience for us, um, with a lot of elements that will need to be reinforced in the next future. Um, with a lot of uh, partners that will need to be involved. But I think uh, it's time for a beer now for us and to cheers with uh, you guys of EY and Posti that made us um, succeed in this project and made this all possible. So thank you. Thank you, Federico, and thanks for this impressive vision uh, for the future, based on, as you say, the sustainability, engagement for consumer, transparency, interoperability with your uh, uh, suppliers. Uh, so we think that uh, blockchain can uh, uh, support the innovation part of uh, your company and in general of the company that operate in uh, manufacturer to um, be able uh, to create uh, this, uh, this value for, for their business. So we think that uh, EY of chain uh, um, traceability can enable uh, to provide a simpler way for the organization such as uh, Peroni to build a shared ecosystem around the fungible and non-fungible tokens. So let's now continue with the masterclass I lend it over to Federico De Poli and Rafael Fave, which uh, are going to explain as deeply what are tokens, which are their features, and we'll go through some other real use cases of tokens implementation in supply chains. Thanks again, Federico, and uh, we Thank uh, you. introduce uh, the floor is of the other Federico De Poli. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Giuseppe, and thank you, Federico, for the demonstration you made us of how and why Peroni is currently creating NFTs on the public network, which is very intriguing for the future. So what we're going to do today is going to talk about the tokens, going a bit into what they are and how you can leverage the key characteristics of them. But first, I would like to give you some context why those tokens are getting important in the market. So. Companies nowadays are facing, of course, pressure because there is cost reduction, there is business, op business optimizations to do, but they also need to find new ways to differentiate themselves, to create new revenue streams, and also to optimize their existing technologies, their existing processes using the new technologies. This is a process which is quite, let's say, simple for some technology, which is already established and easy to use, but there is technology like the blockchain that requires a deeper understanding of what is behind it. And tokenization especially is one of them because basically with tokenization, what we are doing is converting the asset into a unique digital representation. And therefore we are creating actually a digital object on the blockchain, which is going to be representing a physical assets in the reality. And that is the example, of course, of the batches of beer that Peron is creating right now. So it's gonna be key in the future to leverage tokenizations because this is going to enable an interoperable system between different parties, different IT systems, and therefore is going to push for more and more use cases on the blockchain itself. The first difference I want to highlight to you is the fungible versus non-fungible tokens. This is quite important because we all know 
uh, what are what is the token right now, but we should know also the differences. The fungible tokens usually it's something that doesn't have uniqueness. So every token has the same characteristics, the same value. One example, one simple example is the currency. This is very efficient if I want to exchange something that doesn't have a unique value. When I want to trade something which could have a unique value, what I have to do is go into the NFTs or non-fungible tokens, which are representing a physical asset like a house, a car, or a stock. And buying those assets requires a counter value that can be different. So I can decide the price for my music. I can decide my price for my uh, picture, my art piece, and I can sell it on the internet through the blockchain by selling by NFT. Those tokens are basically enabled by the standards. So on Ethereum, we have a few standards we should be mindful, and I want to go through three of them. The standards are defined by the so-called Ethereum request for comments, which are basically technical documents used to define set of rules, which when, when approved by the community will become improvements to the Ethereum ecosystem and therefore could be used by anybody on the blockchain. The main ERC standards for tokens are ERC20, which is the standard we use to create fungible tokens. That means all the ERC20 tokens in a single contract are going to be exactly the same, no differences. We have ERC721, which is an open standard that instead describes the non-fungible and unique tokens, which means every asset is different. It can contain a different set of information. We will see in a few seconds what I mean. And then we have ERC-1155, which is quite new compared to the other tools, but it's going to be interesting in the future because it's gonna allow people to work with a single smart contract on the blockchain, but having both fungible and non-fungible tokens in the same smart contract, therefore I can make a lot of efficiency and also allows to make more efficiency because basically it allows to make batching, batch transactions for non-fungible tokens. So I can transfer 100 or 1,000 non-fungible tokens with a single transaction on the blockchain, which, which makes that very, very efficient from the blockchain usage perspective. So those concepts are very important. And now let's dive into another concept, which is related to the non-fungible tokens, which is the token metadata. When we talk about token metadata, we are talking about the content and information which sits within a fungible token. Let's talk about 721 for now, but we can do pretty much the same with 1155 non-fungibles as well. The metadata itself is a string, and this string usually contains some information. Most of the time, this information is standardized in a JSON format, which makes it very easy to be read by different parties and which makes it very much standardized and accepted by everybody. This JSON, of course, is not stored on the blockchain because we don't want to use the blockchain as a database, but we want to use it as a proof point for our information, but it's rather stored as a universal resource identifier. That means that I have a parameter that I can use to go retrieving the content and therefore retrieving my content and my JSON. The content itself is usually pretty standardized for most of the NFTs we are trading in the market right now. So for example, I do have a name, I do have a description, I do have an image. But let's think beyond this concept. Let's think how many information we can add to our token metadata that can be properties specific to my asset. Maybe I don't know which kind of characteristics it has. And also let's imagine we can put the information related to the processing of the raw materials that contributed to create my asset. This makes it very, very interesting for our supply chain use cases because I can combine all the information within my token. I can then transfer my token to any party I want within my supply chain, my value chain. And therefore I can not just move the asset, I can move also my information and I can continue to have real-time management of the information on the blockchain in an immutable way. I spoke about immutable just a few seconds ago because I would like to introduce also a couple of concepts which are going to become key if we think about using tokenization for enterprise and for enterprise use cases. The first one is going to be the access to the data because let's imagine we would like to track location of an asset on the blockchain 
And we don't want to share this information to the parties that are not uh, supposed to see it. So for example, I want to show it just to my business partners. Introducing something that restricts the access to the metadata content is going to be key to use metadata and tokens for the enterprise use cases. And what we can do for that is work in two different ways or maybe combine the two ways together. The first one is going to be working within my enterprise application to basically authenticate and authorize the user to see the metadata. That is the most easy one, but of course, it doesn't provide an, let's say, a 100% reliable way to authenticate. So what we can do also could be to enforce this authentication, this authorization, by adding some kind of verification through the use of smart contracts. This is what we are looking right now in terms of research, and it's something that we plan to introduce in the future to give us the possibility to have real enterprise use cases using the blockchain, together, of course, with privacy and all the techniques that we already know. The second concept we have is the mutability of the content. This is another very important concept because most of the time we update the metadata without really needing to do that. Most of the time we just want to update a value of my metadata, maybe coming from some devices, and that makes inefficient to continuously change the token URI to match the new value that I have just received. So the concept of mutability allows us to basically think outside the box and say, if a data doesn't need to be updated, let's just handle it off the chain, but let's combine the mutable part of the content with the mutable part, and let's maybe make some kind of uh, uh, average registration every hour, every six hour, every day, to make sure that we can always verify the authenticity of the data that we have received from our uh, IoT devices. Combining those two things is gonna be key because most of the time there is a lot of data coming, there is a lot of data that I don't want to show to people in the blockchain and therefore I should be mindful and I should be uh, very well structured in accessing the metadata related to my token. So we have seen the, the key elements related to the tokenization. Uh, we have also, let's say, understood probably how tokenization can enable new business opportunities. So those business opportunities, of course, could be built on top of different types of tokens. We can think about fungible tokens, which could allow us to exchange any value on the blockchain or potentially also trade inventory of assets that I don't need to track as a unique asset on the blockchain. But let's consider more the NFTs and the non-fungible token power. Apart from the buzzing and of course the momentum that is going on in the market, we should be mindful of NFTs because they represent real world assets. And this is very important because those assets are really irreplaceable and cannot be exchanged and replaced easily. So creating those NFTs and continuing to work with NFTs is gonna be important because moving forward, we will be able to have assets represented within the supply chains and we will be able to trade them and move them consistently. And we will be able also to carry on information, giving the companies leveraging tokenization, a lot of information to use, a lot of information to see, and at the end of the day, enabling new business models and also driving that cost efficiency that we were mentioning earlier. That being said, I would like to pass it to Raphael, uh, which is going to make a deep dive on some other real use cases, apart from the Peroni one that we just seen, and guide us through what they did and how they leverage tokens. So Raphael, up to you. Thanks, Federico. Um... After we've learned about the real world tokenization use case and also deepened our understanding about the nuts and bolts of tokenization, I want to change altitude a little bit. Um, specifically, I also want to talk about a few concepts or principles um, that we have learned while implementing tokenization use cases with our clients. Um, and I hope that this will help you and your team to tackle the complexities in the heart of your use case uh, by focusing on the essential parts, so to speak. Um, okay, oh, perfect, thank you. Um, one of the first things I want to talk about is semantics. If you are designing a new product and you are used to doing something like domain-driven design or along those lines, you're used to 
modeling your domain as aggregates consisting of entities and value objects and so on. With tokenization, this is a little bit different because you're not talking about your aggregates and the use cases concerning the aggregates. You're talking about a thing related to these aggregates. So these are completely different use cases which are just tied to it. Uh, we come later back to this um, because what I want to show you is that by using this kind of principles or concepts, um, use cases or the important parts kind of can emerge from, 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 the, set, from the things you already have. Yeah? Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so what are one of the first categorizations people talk about when they kind of get introduced to tokens are the practical types. So what are those? The basic one, and uh, as Federico already also said, the most straightforward one is probably payment, uh, where we use ERC-20 tokens, for example. Next part would be security tokens. Um, could be analogous to traditional shares or fractional ownership or something like this along the lines. And the third category or third type of token, uh, which you probably encounter the most in supply chain use cases, is the utility token, because it's just a container that can be passed around. Uh, but whatever you think the categorization is, it's not always clear and it's not always exclusive. And especially if you're planning on doing a cross-border use case, uh, which most of you probably will if you are in supply chain and want to do the organization, always consult with your lawyer because these can have severe regulatory implications on what you can do and how you have to structure and also secure your application. Next, please. Um, free value drivers for tokenization. Um, there's a lot of buzz around those uh, different tokenization use cases in supply chain, but most often they drill down to these free drivers, which just enable you to deliver value to your customers. First one would be possession, yeah? that the possession of the token uh, by itself is valuable. Uh, second one, entitlement, in the good abstract kind. Yeah? Uh, so, this, the, the possession kind of means that you have the right to do something and you're also provided with a framework to exercise this right and this is valuable. And the third thing is metadata. Uh, while not only the metadata about your domain aggregate per se or the properties, but also the relationship and the history of the possession and entitlement, uh, which can drive various use cases. And every viable block uh, tokenization use case most of the time involves those three ideas to a certain degree, uh, which we'll see later on. And um, the third cluster here would be those dominant supply chain use case categories, um, which are track and trace, process quality, and provenance. Yeah, uh, they pop out very frequently. And again, most projects mix aspects of these categories in order to cater to the needs of the industries. I say this explicitly because very often you hear, okay, we have this uh, supply chain use case and it's traditional track and trace. Well, not really, or not always, yeah. Um, there also comes in something like, uh, we also get to change or track uh, when, we not only hand this over, but also how was the state of the thing when we handed it over, yeah? uh, which would tie more into the process quality and also which would mean you have different requirements for visualization, uh, different requirements for off-chain data that you need to store and so on and so forth. And next on, I actually have three use cases where I kind of want to try this out with you a little bit on how we can how we can use these different categories before to 
sketch up a solution quite quite quickly or determine what would be the important parts of it. I don't know if we managed to get through all three of them, but maybe we can just try. Uh, Vasim, uh, is the chat active? Because I don't seem to be able to post anything. You should be able to speak between the panelists. The chat between the attendees is currently disabled. Ah, OK. So OK, no worries. I'll try it like this. Um, one of the first uh, use cases I brought here is an incentive program. Yeah. Um, a lot of the inbound and outbound logistics has to be or needs to be automated in order to get or to reach their uh, um, automation KPIs and say like, OK, we have to get uh, 20 percent faster uh, with process A or C and so on and so forth. But it's actually quite difficult because there's a lot of manual labor involved. And uh, all those sensors and uh, IoT systems that are involved in order to, to deliver these are very expensive and therefore prohibitive to incremental automation. Yeah? Um, a quick sort of quick fix uh, uh, by, by one of our customers was to try to incentivize truck drivers who already use the app to publish events uh, real time. And so kind of to, to get those events quick into the system. Um, you may ask, OK, how, how does this really provide value? It seems like, OK, I'm giving out money uh, to, to truck drivers. And yes, you do this. But on the other hand, um, the performance gains you can have, if modeled correctly, uh, can be tremendous. Um, so if we look back at our token types, value drivers, and use case categories, yeah? how does this use case fit in here? For the token types, we have payment, security, utility. Um, actually, a lot of people, when you talk to them, would lean towards the, the payment token, which is not necessarily false, but the correct answer is leave this to the lawyers, yes, <laughs> because uh, that's not something you get to decide or you want to decide. Um, because further down the line, this will have, as said previously, uh, some implications for how you also have to secure your solution and so on. Uh, value drivers. OK, now. Without, without any interactivity, this isn't that fun, I guess. Uh, but um, uh, value drivers is, um, what, what, what could we have here? Um, I'd say for one of those use cases, it's probably not, not, the, not the possession uh, per se, but it's the metadata that comes with automating this task, yeah? Um, okay, but we just go through the other use cases. Uh, sensitive freight train, uh, that's also a very popular use case. Um, and one of, the, one of the aspects that makes this or can make this economically is that if you think that in, on average, a product recall could cost 10.5 million euros. Um, for example, yeah. So, uh, depending on your industry and what you're doing, uh, an investment in this area can be really pay off dramatically, uh, not only from a financial side but also from the reputational side and so on. Yeah. I think I don't really have to explain these because they are kind of straightforward and everybody knows this one. Uh, can we go to the next one, please? Trusted origin. Uh, this was one of the very first uh, token use cases, uh, tokenization use, use cases, which came up as early as 2016 and 2017. Um, and it was one of those things the, which are impossible to get right correctly and get it right through bigger supply chains uh, without some regulatory pressure. Yeah? And now, for example, in Germany, um, this regulatory pressure is, is here. Uh, 
for example, with this new sustainable supply chain law. And we're really looking forward to kind of um, getting to start to digitize at the edges of the supply chain to make tokenization, the flow of tokens through the whole supply chain work out here. Yeah? And here, traditionally, it's actually quite similar to the Bira Peroni use case, uh, which is sourced nationally, while internationally, uh, the process gets way more complex. And the last thing is uh, I want to talk about are the lessons we learned for cross-border token use cases. Yeah. Um, the first point kind of relates to what I said at the beginning about token types. Yes, tokens are cool, but the taxman isn't cool about them. Yeah. Seek advice early and often and kind of sketch out your regulatory framework. Um, very importantly, you're doing digitalization, not a blockchain project. Yeah. We're just using the technology, but we're changing processes. A lot of people have to be involved, um, try to get this change management right before you try to tell them how cool block blockchain is, for example. And third, consumers still don't speak blockchain. Yeah? For most of them, it's still not accessible in the sense that um, without a lot of information, they don't really, um, they can't derive the value from, from certain parts of transparency if you don't over communicate this aspect, for example. And fourth and most important probably is low hanging fruits versus new business models. Yeah. Where are you starting? Uh, low hanging fruits, perfect to get your foot in the door, to get a team going to build up knowledge, but the real impactful use cases are probably require you to cultivate your network. Um, so that was from my part. Uh, thank you very much. And now I want to give back to Federico for some insights on our platform capabilities on how you can really leverage the things we have already built uh, in your supply chain. Yeah, thank you, Raphael. Uh, we will wrap up the masterclass with a couple of things I would like also to show you a uh, quick more, but more detailed demo of our tokenization capabilities so we can cover back on what we didn't see yesterday. But let's start first with why we should tokenize our assets. There is different opportunities here. Uh, this, I will start from the last one just because it's the more easy to understand. The first one is transparency. This is because I'm gonna put my tokens on the public blockchain or any blockchain, but let's say public blockchain. And this data, these assets is going to be available here in the blockchain. So everybody will be able to see it. And that is very good if I want to give transparency into my ecosystem. The second reason is that blockchain and tokenizations allows you to do asset fractionality. So we do have maybe physical assets we cannot fraction uh, because they are by nature not possible to be split. With the use of tokens, we can potentially share the pooling of, uh, share the, the, the property of a pool of cars. We can share the rights, the digital rights, the legal rights of something without actually transferring it. So asset fractionality is one of the reasons to create tokens on the blockchain. Of course, this is much greater applicable to everything in the financial markets, but let's think about supply chain for now. The last topic I would like to cover is the operational efficiency. Using the tokens through the blockchain can help us streamlining the IT systems because basically I don't need to create point-to-point -point integrations. I can just use the same network, use the same set of smart contracts, create interoperability. And at the end of the day, I will have to do a transaction, but I will not have to make system integration, hard system integration. I will not to create, I will not have to create dedicated infrastructure to the integration. And therefore I will get also some savings and therefore I will get operational efficiency. Right now, what we are doing through our blockchain UI.com is going to release pretty soon to the market, few capabilities you will be able to use. 
Uh, the first one we're going to have is going to be the core capabilities, which are the notarization and the tokenization service. Notarization is going to allow you to make any kind of notarization transaction to have a trusted and unchangeable proof of the information on the blockchain. Tokenization, we'll see how it works in a few seconds, lets you create fungible or non-fungible tokens at ease and allows you to work with their features and functionalities, therefore allowing me to fully trace the asset through its life. We're going to have also value chain traceability, which is going to basically let me map the value chain, my value chain, and combine notarization and tokenizations on the blockchain to track asset movement, but also <clears throat> put proof of information. And the fourth one is going to be doing asset traceability through the use of tokens, focusing on ownership, focusing on locations, focusing on all the changes to the metadata, and all these things are going to get visible through our ops chain, so through our explorer and visualizer on blockchain ui.com. I will just quickly switch my screen share to go into our blockchain ui.com. As you can see right now, we are into blockchain ui.com, specifically into our tokens functionality. I would like to show you the capabilities that we have, and those are going to come pretty soon to public. We're gonna have the possibility to deploy a new token contract, which is going to be a non-fungible tokens. That means you want to create your NFTs, you can do it through our blockchain, y.com. We can create fungible tokens as well. So you want to create your new, new asset, uh, new crypto asset. You can potentially do it through our blockchain, y.com. Just for the sake of time, I have created a couple of contracts already. So we do have our fungible tokens. And as you can see, we have a balance of 20 because I have already created my assets. Doing that through a fungible contract allows me to basically easily mint new tokens as I am the owner of the contract. And when they are minted, I'm gonna see them in my balance. It allows me also to transfer a certain amount of tokens to any party so I can move my assets at ease using our ops chain applications. And we can also work with NFTs. That means that I can create my NFT. I can put any serial number I want, but potentially I can use also some helpers to use standards for codification. When I have created my token, I am able to go seeing the details. I am able to go adding some metadata, as you can see. So this is a very helpful view, but of course you can also go raw, raw and use JSON format as well. You can also track the location of the asset, which we've seen already yesterday. So I can add some details about the position and then you can update the metadata. You can also transfer your NFT, which makes you possible to transfer any token to any party we have. So for example, I can transfer to Peroni here and transfer my NFT and they can transfer my NFT as well. And you can also see the full history of the token. So we have a very powerful uh, capabilities for tokenization, which are going to get expanded in the future when we add also new token standards. In the meantime, you have seen, we just received our new 50 fungible tokens. And I wanted to show you that to give you a feeling of the easy of work with the fungible and non-fungible tokens through blockchainey.com. So I would like to stop the screen sharing. I would like to see if there is any question we can take. So I'm gonna just circle back to Wasim and actually also our colleagues to see if there is any question. I, I see one question coming, which is what were the key challenges to actually linking physical products with non-fungible tokens? What work is there left to do in the area of attestation between real world assets and digital tokens? I see Raphael nudging. So Raphael, if you want to take this one, feel free to jump in. Uh, this is, and always has been the, the challenge. And um, to be honest, it highly depends on what your physical, physical asset is, yeah? Um, I don't know any specifics from the from the Peroni use case. Maybe Federico can then extrapolate on this. Uh, but uh, for for example, uh, when when linking truck trailers, uh, there are various uh, standardized um, serial numbers you could use. Or uh, what also has been uh, in the talks lately uh, would be to talk. 
not everybody knows that, for example, trailers have standardized onboarded uh, telematics boxes, which also have a unique ID, which you can use to kind of link the, the trailer and the NFT and therefore also the metadata to those tokens through this unique ID of this telematics uh, box or telematics computer, which is on board. Federico, do you want to add something for how you did it with Peroni? Yeah, basically uh, what we did was connecting all the pieces. So for example, uh, there is all the actors sending their materials. For example, we talk about the malt and basically the malt is getting sent every a certain amount of time by the mills. Those mills sends the material, the material is received by Peroni. Uh, it has information included within and therefore uh, we store and create a new token for the batch of malt, uh, including the information regarding the, the traceability. So usually what we do is creating the digital assets based on what is really feasible to track. So if you want to track, uh, for example, all the bottles of Peroni as a non-fungible token, then probably not, not a good idea, at least for now, given the cost of tokenizing a good on, on Ethereum mainnet, but definitely tokenizing batches of materials which comes together makes sense in this case. Uh, of course, you might have different use cases, like for example, the premium wine use case, where maybe you produce just a few bottles per year, and you might want to give uh, the buyer something unique that stays with him and maybe stays with him while the wine stays into these kind of special warehouses to, to store the wine for a long period of time. So th that's how Peroni do it. And we could eventually see a live uh, batch of Peroni uh, directly from the landing page. I don't know if we have time to do it. Uh, we, we can definitely do it. Uh, otherwise we can go for more questions. I do see a new question coming. So another question that came in is how we prioritize products and use cases. Uh, I will take this one as I'm within the, let's say our process of prioritizing things uh, since I'm the product owner for traceability. So basically what we do usually is getting feed into our agile process from the market. So we gather inputs from clients, inputs from stakeholders. We fed in into our research process and we basically get out with some uh, new ideas to test. Then we go through user testing and validate the, the use cases that we have and then transition those ideas into the products. Uh, this is very important because we need to put our efforts into something that is really uh, let's say going to have a need in the market. So we've had a process which is very structured in order to be able to create new innovation within our product. Okay, I do see a couple more question. Uh, one is how repeatable is the work you are doing around traceability? Can any company use it for their business? I don't know if Giuseppe wants to take this one. Otherwise, Rafael, if you want to jump in, but I think Giuseppe would like to take this one. Yes, the idea on uh, ops chain traceability is uh, to have a standardized uh, process and product uh, in order to address the request of the major company that want to trace uh, and tokenize uh, each elements of their supply chain. Now we have uh, a, a strong product uh, in order to enable the data gathering of uh, all of this information, the tokenization engine to transfer uh, all of these steps uh, in uh, a metadata format uh, and to tokenize all uh, on uh, the public uh, mainnet of uh, Ethereum and also to build uh, the storytelling uh, uh, engagement uh, through the work code applied on the label of the product. So as you remember, we started uh, into the wine industry after we moved to Ross Distributors Operator and we launched different uh, uh, products, uh, especially in consumer uh, goods industry. And, uh, and now with, uh, with Peroni, we arrived and uh, moving from the classical notarization of this data to the tokenization. 
So the uh, idea is uh, to have the possibility for the all uh, asset uh, into a supply chain to use uh, uh, these uh, um, functionalities, this application, not only to get the full transparency and the uh, guaranteed interoperability in a fragmented supply chain, but also to arrive to another steps that I think is uh, uh, really important, so the automation of the contracts between the parties involved. So the solution and the product is uh, built up in order to standardize uh, the overall uh, projects and the uh, request of the of the client. So we would use uh, a global approach, and uh, we think that uh, especially uh, with a vision on the on the public blockchain, we can uh, achieve this uh, this goal. Thanks, Giuseppe. There is one more, I think, or maybe two more. We'll see. So the first one that came in is basically a concern of us, but I think all the Ethereum market and Ethereum community, if we do expect more flexibility with the upcoming Ethereum 2.0 release, and now we are working on solving for high transaction fees. Uh, this is a question that also Paul likes a lot to answer, basically, we are very well aware about the issue about the fees and our R&D teams are working very hard to implement solution that goes into layer two solutions, but also leverage rollups uh, technologies and implementations in order to basically come to a point where we are consistent about the cost per transactions and we are able to continue to run things at scale. Uh, because right now, the main concern, of course, if you want to create thousands of tokens every day on Ethereum mainnet, it's gonna cost a lot. It's gonna take probably more than how it costs. So it's a rising, a raising concern. Uh, our R&D team is working fully on that. And basically, uh, gonna come out with new solutions very soon in the future. And they're gonna be, of course, part of our blockchainy.com and also our ops chain application specifically. So, seems we do have one more question. I don't know who wants to take it, but basically, uh, the question is which kind of IT system do we generally integrate with? Uh, maybe, again, I don't know, Giuseppe, if you want to take this one, but given the experience and the track record of traceability pro projects that's probably yours as well as we started also with the uh, possibility to integrate uh, with different sources uh, and with uh, a flexible approach the data gathering uh, with the it systems of the company we started also with uh, excel uh, that collect information of uh, chemical products farmers book uh, for the cultivation steps uh, and now we are working also to integrate with uh, api and web services uh, the it systems of the company so the idea is uh, to avoid any kind of replication of data to maintain the data into the systems of the company and to create this tokenization framework on the blockchain that we want to use as a, a middleware that can uh, access uh, to the mainnet uh, the uh, registration and the recording of this data. So uh, basically we are working uh, to have uh, a, a data gathering, uh, as I said, very, very flexible and uh, to integrate uh, from the classical ERP of the companies to, as I said, uh, mobile application dashboard built uh, on the specific request to integrate uh, as suppliers uh, in the case uh, as uh, we, we showed a couple of months ago of a frozen product uh, in another part of the world uh, to connect them uh, with the headquarter of the company or to use uh, a mobile application to and the IoT because it's another uh, in other sources that we are integrating uh, so we combine IoT sensors on the field, sensors on the machine, uh, weather station, where we collect all of this data and we normalize uh, in order to record and tokenize on the blockchain layer. So the, the, the aim of the solution is uh, to integrate the entire landscape of, of, the, of the client and to be uh, ready uh, to, to have the, the right level of flexibility with the request of the companies that want to use blockchain layer and the EY of Centros. Perfect. Thank you, Giuseppe. I would like to thank you. I would like to thank you also, Rafael, and also Federico Sanella from Birra Peroni that was with us. 
Now we have time for a break with commentary. So let's continue. All right. That was a great topic. I, I have been waiting all day to, to, to listen to this because the, the area of NFTs has just been exploding. And, and I do think, um, you know, this team has been working on these for, for, for quite a while before they were necessarily in the, in, the, in the public eye. And it's just so exciting to see these applications coming in. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do reflect back at it and, and I think um, it seems every good use case or every good technology starts with something involving alcohol <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I'm very confident if anyone's going to figure out uh, food traceability it'll be the Italians and, and, and ensuring that these supply chains are secure and accurate um, but uh, uh, curious what were some of your thoughts um, as, as you listen to the NFT conversation uh, thanks, James. Um, all jokes aside, I think traceability in uh, agriculture is an area of big interest, um, especially for, for us at the World Food Program. We work uh, very closely with smallholder farmers in, in many different countries. And in fact, um, as, as was mentioned in the Peroni case, consumers, especially in, in Europe and in the US and, and other um, high income countries are really concerned about the origins of their food and are willing to pay a premium for that. So, uh, for example, we've been piloting a, a blockchain solution in Jordan with a startup called The Capitalist, where we're trying to enable tra traceability of vegetables from uh, Jordanian farmers all the way to markets in Europe. And, and the result of that would be higher premiums for the farmers that are participating. Sure. So there are direct benefits both to the consumers who wanna see where their food is coming from, but also to the farmers who receive a premium for participation. No, I think that's really neat. And, and, and you know, as, as uh, Federico was walking through some of the examples there of how, um, how we can start to track this, it, it, it just, it always occurs to me how this information that the blockchain starts collecting is really captured in this like time series, right? And just in some ways, just as important as the metadata, uh, and, and I, I fully agree the structure around this metadata is super important, but the, the time in between the capturing of the data is, is important as well too, right? Because we start to develop these patterns that, that can really be used to visualize and analyze supply chains in a way that very difficult to do now, right? So the, the, even just the timestamping aspect of this is, uh, is is really transformative in the way that we think of supply chains. Yeah, um, I, I totally agree, James. I, especially on the track and trace application, um, that is something that I find particularly exciting and is very relevant for, for the World Food Program, but also for a lot of humanitarian organizations because it allows us to increase the transparency in our own supply chains. And in fact, uh, donations from a lot of countries um, are in fact physical goods. So it could be um, health supplies, especially now in, in, in the fact that we're dealing with COVID, vaccines, uh, ventilators. Um, for the World Food Program, we receive actual physical food, uh, bags of grain or rice or corn. So to be able to track and trace where those donations are going uh, is really critical for both us and for our donors. And it's very similar to the topic that we were discussing earlier with, with Trace and EFAD, tracing uh, financial donations, right? Yeah. So for us, blockchain really is about increasing the transparency of our operations and enabling um, our donors to, to know exactly where um, the funding or physical goods are ending up. Yeah, that's a really cool point. And, you know, I think um, we made some references to some of the buzz around NFTs and, and, and what you see in the headlines and, you know, things are kind of great, but, but they're here, right? And, and I asked actually for this slide to come up uh, during our commentary, because if you've been following along with the Popes, here's a good chance for you to, to, to claim it. Um, you're dealing with NFTs, right? That's uh, th these things are starting to pop up um, all over the place, and I really do feel strongly that this is just going to be uh, so much of the core of the way that supply chain works between uh, business partners across ecosystems. And what I liked particularly about the Peroni use case is how they are 
focused on using this to build trust with customers, right? Um, there's a lot of great use cases around counterfeits and, and, and things that are, and raw materials and things that are somewhat upstream, but this can come all the way down to an improved customer experience and, and, and building trust with the folks that are using your products. Um, just a really cool all around way of, of, of thinking about this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also in, in terms of quality or within the, the ad sector, I think another dimension that is exciting is looking at labor rights. And this is particularly relevant in the seafood industry. And if we're able to trace exactly where fish comes from, which is a big, big challenge currently, then we can also understand if those companies or, or fishing boats are, are practicing um, humane and, and internationally approved labor standards. And, and this is something that we were exploring um, in, my, in my previous role at uh, the US Agency for International Development in Southeast Asia. How do we, again, it goes back to transparency. So it's both about the environmental impacts of how we grow food and transport food, but also the, the labor rights and, and standards and, and equity of the people that are producing the food that we eat every day. Really cool. I mean, it is all an interconnected web, right? And I think um, the, the, the information, the data that starts to, to emerge from this um, is, is going to be huge. I think the way we handle that data, uh, keep it private and secure is, is, is going to be super important. I'm looking forward to the next uh, set of speakers that are going to talk about how this stuff is, is actually being represented on a blockchain in terms of complex logic. Um, so with that, um, I think it's time to hand it over to the next set of speakers. Great. Thanks, James. Thanks. Up next, performing complex calculations and managing complex workflows using smart contracting logic with Karthik and Siddharth. Take it away, Jens. Hey, folks. Hello, everyone. Screen. All right. Uh, well, everyone, this is Kartik Saripuram uh, from EY. Uh, as we begin, we'll, uh, we'll be briefly introduce ourselves. And today we'll be going over one of the more uh, technical topics where we go into how we are leveraging smart contracts and complex calculations, especially how, and how they're managed using smart contracts. So uh, to introduce myself, my name is Karthik Saripuram, uh, play the role of solution architect and in, uh, a researcher at Ernst & Young, uh, been with blockchain practice for over five years and work with uh, the team on platform engineering aspects and also open source initiatives. Hi, um, I am Siddharth, Siddharth Pandey. I've been, I'm part of uh, Microsoft and uh, engineering manager working on the Royalty space. Uh, I've been uh, part of this platform that we are developing for Royalty's calculation that is leveraging blockchain. I'm happy to be here to share uh, some of the learnings and the work that we are doing on that platform. So today we will be going over uh, how uh, Microsoft blo royalties, blockchain uh, royalties blockchain solution has taken Ethereum as a fundamental backbone for solving some of the complex calculations. As we get into it today, we'll begin with providing a brief overview of the business problem at hand, go into some of the aspects of how the value, uh, some of the value propositions, the pain points, and then we lead it on into solution architecture, which will be uh, taken into detail by Siddharth. And uh, finally, we'll be going over smart contract architecture and application learnings. So to begin the project, I'll give you a brief, I'll give a brief context of what the Microsoft project is. Uh, uh, Microsoft project, Microsoft X game, Xbox games are published uh, by the royalties platform by publishing companies. Uh, and, uh, and, and royalties are paid to these companies on the basis of pre-agreed upon contractual obligations. And these statements are available to the partners 45 days after the month end, even though the royalties can be calculated in situ. So uh, as we go over the solution, one of the key things that we'll notice is that 
uh, there are a lot of challenges and issues that have been faced originally uh, using legacy solution. And today we'll be going over uh, some of those specific aspects of uh, the uh, blockchain solution itself as, uh, as it was implemented in the royalties of uh, Rock's platform. Some of the key highlights to go over here are, uh, uh, we can boast about are, today we have about $3 million of daily transactional uh, processing capability, wherein we have, uh, where we are providing full transparency and access to transaction level detail to the partners. We'll be going over some of these aspects as we go into the solution details in the follow-up slides. But uh, one of the primary aspects of the blockchain solution that, we have, that has been implemented is the ability to be, uh, to be calculating royalties or calculating complex calculations and making them transparent to the various participants in the blockchain network. The second uh, key feature over here is the lag time. Today, when we are uh, today or in legacy system, when we are calculating royalties, royalties are typically calculated at the end of the month, and statements are then published to the partners uh, 45 days after the end of the month. Uh, so, one of the key highlights here is that the processing of royalties, are what has been taking about almost two hours, even before it gets into the reconciliation procedures, has is now taking less than 10 minutes. And the, specifically, this particular aspect is around contract setup and onboarding, the details of which we'll be going over uh, as we go into the technical aspects as well. But the main thing to highlight is that what on uh, the aspects of onboarding to uh, get a new partner or get new publishing companies and partner them with Microsoft Xbox, what was originally would take uh, manual efforts of about two hours has been reduced to less than 10 minutes. The third uh, main highlight is about the fact that the uh, publishers are now able to get the royalties or get a view into their uh, financial statements uh, in mere real time. So where, wherein it was originally 45 days, we are now able to achieve uh, under less than four minutes. And finally, uh, the, uh, under less than four minutes for uh, earned royalties and of less than seven days for publishing these statements. So these are some of the key highlights that we can uh, that you are uh, that the royalty solution boasts of, and the capabilities. As we go uh, into the next slide, we'll go into the some of the details of uh, the capabilities of these various features as well. But stay, but more or less, what we are trying to establish here, or what we're trying to point out here, is that the royalties blockchain solution has prov provided us uh, an aspect of providing full transparency, near real-time near real -time access to data, and providing an immutable record of uh, information. So now we'll uh, talk about what are the business value proposition or the economic value chain. Uh, going over today the process of uh, how royalties are generated or how royalties are set up is that when uh, intellectual property is first developed by uh, developers, graphic designers, or uh, any artists, these could be individual game developers, and they interact with their marketing or game publishing companies. So individual development studios working with bigger uh, game publishing companies, which are uh, uh, much broader and deal with uh, deal with Microsoft directly in terms of calculating royalties. These are then uh, these royalties or these these sorry these marketing pub, uh, or publishing companies then deal with distribution companies, and these distribution companies uh, and the customers over there are imp impact the sales revenue. So these sales revenue that comes from the distribution company, like say Microsoft, to the point of time it reaches back to the partners, it takes over thirty to forty five days. And by the time these statements get actualized uh, into uh, uh, accounting ledgers, into individual partners' systems or publishing IT systems, these royalty statements and partners take almost 60 to 75 days. So these, uh, as, as, as in this value proposition, one of the main challenges that we see in, uh, in using or in actually addressing some of the partners' issues are the lead time for statements. The amount of time it takes for statements is uh, quite large, uh, and most of this is uh, owing to internal reconciliation efforts, uh, which are which can happen repeated number of times between master data to your uh, upstream master data to sales data to then all the way down to the royalties calculation uh, process and all the way down to statements. So different points in the process require different reconciliation measures. 
and uh, one of, this is one of the one of the key challenging points that uh, that has been noted or that has been identified uh, as an indicator or as an issue or a constraint for operational efficiency. <clears throat> The other uh, pain point over here is about the black box calculations. The calculations that are leveraged to calculate royalties are fairly black box in, in a non-blockchain situation. What that means is that, say for example, uh, like, uh, there is a publishing company that publishes a game on Microsoft Xbox, and say they're uh, there to receive, say, uh, some X amount of royalty on every game that is purchased on the platform. When such a game is purchased on the platform uh, and it is registered in the royalties block, uh, in the royalty system, uh, any changes to say make change to a royalty or make any changes to the contract terms, change any product master details like the pricing or discounting details and so on, or managing any of them has become more or less a challenge uh, in the in a legacy solution. So with with all of these challenges in mind, we. Uh, uh, we looked at various blockchain, uh, various blockchain solutions and more particularly various forms of Ethereum. What started off as a process where we began with the proof of work uh, network uh, in the, at the beginning over three years ago, is now we are, in, uh, we are, we are now leveraging uh, a much more faster and scaled up network like Quorum uh, and, using, and specifically using the latest and greatest of smart contract and Ethereum standards. And we are now in, uh, of, uh, in a fork of post uh, Spurious Dragon where we are implementing most, uh, where we are updating or managing our smart contracts today. Uh, we'll go into more of the smart contracts details post uh, solution architecture. So in short, what we have established is identified a way to uh, process out or flow, uh, establish a process flow of how the different digital assets can be managed, digitized in the form of smart contracts, in such a way that the terms and conditions that are associated with those contracts or those digital assets are agreed, which are agreed upon by relevant parties, are coded, reviewed, and approved by relevant participants. This is where we leverage smart contracts to digitize or register these different, uh, 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 different royalty contracts, the associated terms and conditions, and also the calculation logic itself. And these smart contracts are then used along with the RESTful API interface to be able to uh, integrate with the rest of the systems in Microsoft to effectively calculate royalties. The advantages of it are that the transactions are recorded on the network as the uh, strictly as per the terms and conditions defined in the smart contracts, thus playing the effect of immutable contract logic that needs to be static at a certain point in time uh, for calculating royalties. Uh, now, while different contracts can have different uh, logical interfaces or logical components, or can have different variations of those logic, smart contracts themselves can be upgraded, which can, which we'll also go into detail uh, post the solution architecture review. Um, uh, the other advantage or the main advantage of this is that participants now get access to uh, applicable information through their own uh, node or APIs. So the main, uh, uh, the main, advantage of using uh, a blockchain ledger here was that Microsoft along with their gaming partners can be on one network, share information about products or to uh, digitize those products as tokens, uh, dig uh, contracts, digitize any terms and conditions as smart contracts uh, or con uh, contractual logical, uh, contractual logic enabled smart contracts. And finally, the process of ingestion, which is again going into the uh, processing of royalties against these established contracts, calculation features, and product tokens. In this manner, the being on the same network, participants get a full scale view into not just the transactions and statements, but also their individual uh, individual products that are uh, that are affected by a particular. A calculation or a particular statement or a revenue that, that impacts the sales of a particular uh, game or a set of games or how they are published on the network or how they are made available on the platform. Um, before I uh, uh, hand off to Siddharth to go into the details of the actual calculation experience, I'll give a brief overview of the various product features and capabilities. Uh, if we start with uh, going from left to right, we have a vendor setup, which is uh, the, these products and features also as I'm going through would be 
something somewhat similar to how the uh, aligned to how the business process also was structured in the in the previous slide. So where we have seen the process of registration of assets, registration of terms and conditions, uh, enabling those terms and conditions through smart contracts, and finally enabling the integrations with the rest of the system. Uh, so in each of the steps or in, in each segment of the steps, we have uh, various uh, product features and capabilities enabled. As part of vendor management or vendor setup, uh, we have automated contract onboarding, which uh, provides the ability for uh, paper contracts or PDF contracts to be digitized and made available uh, as made available in the, uh, to, in the form of the metadata uh, to then be registered as smart contracts. We, as part of vendor setup, we also tokenize the various assets wherein the different games are registered as ERC721 tokens. And one of the features in development we are looking at today is to uh, how to synchronize the various uh, product details that are registered upstream uh, to, so that the tally of the products that are registered or created in the product master is in line with the product tokens that are registered on the blockchain. And uh, the next set of features is uh, more so into the smart contract creation. We have uh, some of the main features over here are the transparent contract lifecycle management. Uh, because the contract setup is managed on the ledger, uh, the, uh, the aspect of setting up the different contract terms, changing the metadata of that contract is visible and made transparent uh, to any participant on the blockchain. We, uh, over a period of uh, several iterations and several research and uh, performance testing, uh, we have come up with uh, a fairly modular design of how different calculation contracts or business logic, so to speak, can be uh, digitized in the form of smart contracts. Uh, we also have a, we are also working on upgradability aspects, which will go into detail uh, post solution review. And, uh, and we also have ability to use the, uh, some of the standard ways of capturing events from uh, the smart contracts of the blockchain to be able to send notifications either for contract modifications or to prove uh, any ownership of provenance. Then uh, the main, uh, the other feature, uh, set of features that we have also uh, in this solution is a transaction ingestion and royalty calculation where we have real-time transaction and earned royalty visibility, along with the drill down capabilities, which will be, uh, which will be uh, highlighted in the, in the demo that we'll be going over later. Uh, finally, in terms of the ERP integration and compliance checks, we have features for invoicing, accounting, and reporting, which where uh, there is fully integrated game and uh, publisher invoicing into accounting and GL ledgers within Microsoft. We have a uh, ERP, custom ERP integration for any on-demand accounting, and we're also working towards dynamic reporting for downstream royalties. Uh, finally, to mark off uh, the final set of features, we uh, have been working on uh, various forms of compliance features ranging from security to, uh, uh, to accounting to uh, any other form of uh, compliance checks that are there. Uh, that are instituted by the business as part of processing royalties or maintaining these operational uh, efficiencies. So we have built-in access controls associated with these smart contracts uh, for compliance and uh, for compliance purposes and also specific features or capabilities in the solution which enable completeness checks and three-point reconciliation. Uh, with that, uh, I'll hand over to Siddharth. Thanks, Karthik. Um, so the product features and capabilities that Kartag was talking about, that's, uh, I mean, that's uh, um, the end-to-end -end digitization that we have kind of achieved on this platform. That's uh, something that we get great, uh, great feedback on. Uh, obviously, that end-to-end -end digitization along with uh, uh, the transparency that you get on blockchain as well as the, uh, the near real-time decentralized uh, availability of the data for uh, our partners. Uh, those are some of the critical aspects uh, uh, um, from this platform. Now, in terms of um, the efficiencies uh, that we get from automation, so on the slide, you can see uh, there's an operations impact as well as there are partner and benefits. Uh, from an operations uh, perspective, the end-to-end -end, uh, efficiency that we gain through automation, um, that has been really, really great. Um, uh, having the data on the blockchain, um, uh, having that transparency uh, that 
is what leads to the audit savings uh, where uh, uh, you don't have uh, to have uh, those big audits, audits uh, being performed. Um, the accrual accuracy comes in uh, uh, on the platform as the transactions are ingested. We calculate the royalties uh, uh, right at that point of time rather than doing it uh, at the end of the month. Now, the accrual that we have built out is uh, it's a daily accrual. So at the end of the day, we have a accrual process that runs uh, reports on how much we are uh, for accounting deals, how much uh, do we accrue, all that is available from an accounting perspective, which helps uh, with any of the reconciliation or any of the uh, validation that needs to be performed from operations perspective. Similarly, uh, um, you can see from a part-time benefits perspective, you have uh, uh, the visibility in terms of the royalties uh, that are on previously what used to take months, Karthik touched upon that and we'll look at uh, uh, as part of the demo as well, what uh, used to take a month or even more than a month for uh, for our partners to view the uh, royalties on. Now they are able to do uh, see it uh, on, a, on a every four minutes or, uh, or so. Um, the transparency and trust is available on the blockchain. Similarly, or even on our front end perspective, we have moved away from uh, just the PDF based statement. Now they have that uh, available through APIs as well as on the, uh, they can get a few transaction, uh, full transaction visibility available uh, in terms of our APIs as well as the blockchain as well. Uh, I talked about uh, accruals uh, um, uh, going from monthly to daily as well as uh, audits which were uh, manual uh, before now it is a self-serve capability we have also built uh, an uh, expectations uh, framework which i'll talk through a little bit uh, in our solution design uh, that is another capability that uh, provides uh, um, the self-serve audit capability to uh, our partners as well as our users in general and all that kind of brings the customer satisfaction uh, of uh, having that end-to-end -end, uh, digitization available, having the self-serve capabilities. Um, so next, uh, I'll talk through uh, the solution architecture. Um, so some of the capabilities that uh, um, um, Karthik mentioned, those are kind of listed down uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, I will walk through most of them uh, in uh, the demo as well. Uh, the contract onboarding uh, has been automated as well. So instead of users having to uh, create uh, a contract or type a contract uh, terms, uh, we have the capability where uh, you can upload a contract uh, document and uh, uh, it goes through the digitization and you have the contract that is available for setup. Uh, and those contract terms are then pushed over to smart contracts on our uh, blockchain network uh, for execution. Uh, product tokenization, having the ER721 tokens available for all the products. Uh, we'll talk through the ingestion of transactions and I'll give a live demo as well. Um, so all that kind of leads us uh, to have an architecture uh, running on top of Quorum, where as transactions are ingested, we calculate based uh, uh, on the contractual terms, and all these terms are um, actually uh, digitized uh, on smart contracts, um, so that uh, visibility is available for uh, the partners on the network as well. Um, once uh, the transactions are calculated, we have the process to generate statements. Uh, and through that statement, uh, we have capabilities like uh, um, be able to generate an invoice, uh, um, uh, create an accrual for uh, a particular contract. So all that uh, comes in uh, through that end-to-end -end flow can move to, yeah. So this uh, kind of depicts more of a, uh, still a high level technical architecture. And uh, as you can see on the left-hand side, that's where our uh, um, um, our transaction ingestion uh, starts in. Uh, so we have a data ingestion pipeline that brings in all the transactions from various upstream, upstream sources. So think about uh, somebody going and buying uh, an Xbox game, uh, either online or uh, in a retail store. Uh, those are the transactions that flow into our uh, platform through this ingester app. Um, they are sent through, um, they are sent uh, over through an API call and uh, then that API interacts uh, or sends over that transaction to Azure blockchain service. That's our quorum network. And uh, um, that's where the uh, actual calculation happens based on the contractual term. And then we have an event listener component um, that uh, uh, consumes any uh, event emitted out uh, by the blockchain network and uh, it stores uh, some of that, uh, um, the 
earned royalty information in our off-chain Cosmos DB store. Now that off-chain Cosmos uh, DB store is used for uh, analytics purposes. Also, it is used for uh, uh, some of the data that we provide uh, on through our API and UI as well. Um, so we, we get the full transparency of the transaction coming uh, into the blockchain network and being calculated based on the contractual terms. A problem that we still needed to solve was uh, the completeness. Uh, how do we ensure that uh, everything that was supposed to be uh, calculated or all the games that were sold did eventually make it uh, to the blockchain network and we did actually calculate royalties on it. That's where the expectations framework uh, on the right that you see comes in picture. Um, the way um, the expectations framework is designed is that uh, along with the data that gets ingested to the blockchain network, we also have uh, our uh, left-hand side, which is uh, the upstream sources. Uh, we get the uh, a third stream of uh, expectation, which is, uh, we call it an expectation, which basically means that, uh, hey, I do expect that uh, on uh, May 19th, um, this particular product product uh, was sold and uh, there were 200 quantities of that particular product that was sold. Now, when that expectation is set on the framework, what the expectations processor does is that it goes and evaluates that expectation against the blockchain network. So it would go and see that, hey, did I really, um, are there uh, real transactions that were calculated for those uh, products that were sold on May 19? So that's how we kind of do a reconciliation between the left-hand side and right-hand side. And that's what solves the problem of completeness. Um, the framework can also um, uh, be leveraged for test of one capability. So um, not just the completeness, you can actually go and said that, hey, I do expect that this product was sold in this particular geo uh, on this particular date and whatever other attributes that you may want. And uh, based on that test of one expectation, now again, the processor can go and validate uh, on the network itself, uh, was that uh, expectation met or not? So that uh, kind of gives you the self audit capabilities on the platform and uh, makes uh, that uh, process uh, fairly easy. Um, uh, the entire uh, technical architecture is built on Azure. So we have various other components uh, like Kubernetes service, that's where all these uh, uh, dockerized uh, containers are running. Uh, the off-chain store is Cosmetics DB, and uh, uh, we also use the function apps for expectations processor. Um, yeah, uh, a high-level overview of the platform. Uh, I think with that, I can jump on to the demo and uh, give you guys uh, a view of how these capabilities come together. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see now. Um, this is uh, our uh, um, the UI uh, for uh, the platform, the calculation platform. Uh, it opens up uh, with this uh, analytics dashboard, uh, which provides a quick view on how things are progressing on the platform. What are the products uh, that are being calculated? How much uh, royalties earned is there? The geo and the transaction print. Um, so just quick uh, analytic view, and all this is being done based on the the data we uh, store in our off-chain store, which is uh, um, based on the events emitted from our smart contracts. Now from there, uh if I need to search for a partner, I can uh, look at all the various partners that are there. I can search for a contract. So for example, if I have uh, this Contoso, I can look for that contract. Before I get into the contract details, uh, I talked about uh, contract digitization, uh, where instead of somebody having to actually manually create a contract. So if, uh, if you wanna create a manual contract, you have to type in all these terms and then uh, save it uh, so that we get a smart contract having all these attributes populated. We also have the option where uh, you can upload a contract. So this is the, the digitization capability I was talking about. You can go and uh, select a contract PDF. So if I select this contract PDF, um, you can upload that contract and then uh, uh, it goes through, uh, we have an Azure form recognizer service, uh, which uh, leverages OCR as well as uh, machine learning models to extract those contractual terms from the PDF document. And uh, once that uh, 
contract has been digitized, um, the user uh, would get a task. So this is the uh, action required um, that you would see where uh, the user would get to come and see the actual contract that was uh, digitized. So they get to see the various terms that were extracted from the contract. They have the option to review it, uh, make any changes if they feel, otherwise uh, they can save and continue. Um, so that makes uh, the, uh, the automation around the contract setup. Now, once the contract is set up, um, so if I again pull this one up, um, this is where you can see the various contractual terms um, of, uh, um, and all this data is being pulled uh, uh, either from our uh, blockchain uh, smart contracts or from the off-chain DB store as well. Uh, the main part of here is the, uh, the royalty fees, uh, which is defining what is the calculation model that needs to be applied, uh, what are the different products on which we are paying, and if there are any exclusion that needs to be performed. Uh, products like Karthik talked about, these are the, uh, the tokens, ER721 token that are available on the network. Uh, um, so that's a, um, the contract information. Now the same contract information, so uh, I'm logged in over here as a Microsoft user, so I'm able to see this. Um, I also have a persona for a partner, so if a partner logs in, they can also come and see that they have a partner of Microsoft and they see the same Contoso contract available and those contractual terms are available for them to see as well. Some of those um, uh, internal information may not be visible to them, but what is pertinent to a partner, that information is available. We have this contract activity uh, section, which shows any changes that happen on the contract. So not just on the blockchain network, you can see uh, from the UI as well, uh, any changes that happen. Um, we talked about the near real-time visibility uh, of the transaction. So a partner can come any point of time and they can see that, hey, um, so far five of my uh, games have been sold and I can expect to have uh, $50 of uh, royalties um, being earned. And uh, just to simulate that near real-time flow, I'll try to do a quick demo. Hopefully this will work uh, in a live uh, session. So I'm using Postman to send transactions. These are transactions which are basically saying that, hey, this product was sold for this purchase price uh, and this was the quantity, uh, quantity for it. So that's uh, the transaction that goes in. Um, so let me just quickly generate a token and uh, kick this off and then I'll talk about what happens uh, in the back end. So, so far we had uh, uh, five transactions over here. Uh, what I'm doing here is that I'm going to be sending another set of uh, five transactions. Um, so I have these five transaction requests that is uh, um, selected, select the environment and I push that off. So as these transactions are being sent, as we talked about and Karthik touched upon this, um, all the contractual terms are uh, um, in the smart contracts uh, and uh, Karthik would show those uh, later as well. You would see that there are pretty complex uh, um, calculation models that are written in the smart contracts. And as we send these transactions over to the, uh, to the blockchain network, um, we calculate the royalties uh, um, uh, through the smart contracts contracts and then an email, uh, even gets emitted out for uh, uh, the earned royalty. So we had five transactions go over and all of them were successful. So if I come over here and try to um, go back, so I can see that that number jumped from five to 10. So um, the, uh, the block uh, was uh, uh, mind, we get the transaction uh, calculated and the transaction uh, count has changed from five to 10 and the earned royalty has uh, changed from uh, 50 to 100. So that's the near real-time visibility that the partner gets uh, for, uh, uh, for the transactions that are being calculated. Uh, the same thing would be there on the Microsoft side as well. Um, again, the same truth is available here. Uh, we can see uh, what has been calculated. Now, once uh, the transactions are calculated, we have that information um, the next step uh, of the flow is the statement generation. So um, that is also an, a fully automated process that uh, based on the contractual term, most of our contracts are uh, monthly uh, contracts at this point of time. We have some quarterly as well, and we do expect uh, to move to weekly uh, um, statements at some point of time. But uh, uh, let's say for this Contoso contract, if, if I had a monthly uh, statement, 
so when that month uh, completes, uh, um, so end of May is when I can expect that uh, this uh, statement process will kick off and it's going to calculate the statement uh, for uh, uh, that particular contract. And when that statement is uh, made available, uh, all that information is available for uh, uh, for Microsoft as well as the partner to view. Um, you can see the various, uh, um, like the comparison data between the current statement, previous statement, uh, any attachments that are there and support information. So that's available. Um, and uh, uh, once that statement is approved, uh, again, um, uh, this, the end-to-end -end digitization is uh, what is great about the platform. Once a statement is approved, it automatically generates an invoice and then it gets paid out to our partner. So um, that's a quick view of uh, um, the, uh, the architecture that I was talking about. Uh, we're uh, starting from uh, contract uh, setup, uh, which is automated all the way from ingesting transactions, calculating royalties on it on, this, uh, on the network, uh, generating statement, and then uh, paying out uh, to our partner by generating the invoice. Uh, yeah, Karthik, back to you. Thank you, Thank you so that. Let's share my screen. Oh, can, can you stop sharing? Right. Okay. Uh, thanks for that for walking through the demo and providing a view of uh, all the, how the different product features are lining up with uh, the different uh, capabilities that you have showcased in the demo and also walking through the live transaction transaction ingestion and how the appearance how the transactions appear in statements. Uh, so in this part of the section, uh, we would we will go over the uh, details of the smart contract architecture that's powering. Uh, the calculation of these royalties behind the scenes. Um, so I'll, as I go into the smart contract architecture, I'll break them out. I, I'll try to explain them uh, with uh, the perspective of how uh, we were handling the contract setup, the agreement, uh, sorry, the terms and conditions setup and the processing of royalties itself. And we'll highlight some of the key uh, architectural patterns we have followed and uh, we have honed over a period of time, uh, and this will give a good layup as to how we are using upgradability constructs as well. So to start off, uh, I'll go over the high level structure or rather uh, a schematic structure of the smart contracts uh, that are in use. So at the outset, we have uh, three types of, uh, three types of uh, smart contract sets or inheritance patterns here. We have uh, the central piece, which is around uh, the managing of the contractual data, which is the usage of the royalty contract factory uh, and the ability to create agreements based on that royalty contract factory. What that means is that every particular partner or this entire set of architecture, all these, or rather the schema, is uh, repeated for e each and every individual participant or each and every individual relationship. So Microsoft with its partner or with its gaming publisher would have a set of registry, loyalty contract, uh, factory agreements, and so on and so forth, including product token manager and calculation factory. Uh, so the main highlight over here, or the main point to mention over here is that the royalty contract factory establishes a factory pattern to create new royalty contracts, which are essentially the digitized form of the various royalty contract uh, metadata. So in the contract setup, as you've seen in the demo, the various uh, the, uh, details like the contract ID, contract name, and so on are, uh, are, are used to register or create an instance of a new royalty contract using the royalty contract factory. And agreements here are essentially the terms and conditions associated with that royalty contracts. So agreements here could be stipulating conditions around uh, say the, uh, the the royalty rate should that should be applied uh, the, t uh, the time period for which the royalty rate should be applied and the different products or say uh, the product IDs the different uh, uh, the different uh, uh, royalties should be applied to in uh, extending the same uh, pattern of say what you would call as minimal storage on the uh, on the chain 
what we have identified is the ability to extend the agreements or link up the agreements to various product tokens. So as part of storage of the off-chain data or linking the off-chain data on on-chain, we use royalty contract factory to set up the different royalty, uh, royalty contracts, digitize the various me uh, metadata components and terms and conditions, associate uh, unique product identifiers, uh, which are uh, identified by ERC721 to ERC tokens deployed using the product token manager, and then associated with the agreements. Uh, as part of this uh, data pattern or data linking pattern, we also uh, register the calculation contracts. So calculation contracts are essentially individual business logic contracts that determine how the royalty needs to be calculated or what the royalty, what logic should be applied against royalty. So for example, if a contract was set up between Microsoft and uh, a publisher A, uh, which says that game X needs to earn 70% royalty, uh, the, the way it would go about is we create a royalty contract which, uh, uh, which essentially establishes the relationship between Microsoft and the publisher using royalty contract factory, establish the terms so the effective time period for which the terms apply or the royalty contract applies uh, in agreements. Then we associate the different gaming products or the gaming tokens uh, to these various agreements. And then the 10% rate is something that is plugged in in the form of a calculation interface or a calculation module. So this talk, this top level talks about how data and logic is organized. And the bottom part, which is currently what we are say, uh, looking to upgrade using upgradability patterns is the ingestion registry. The aspect of ingestion registry here is to control uh, how processing of transactions happen against these set up product tokens that are associated with royalty terms and conditions. Uh, the, the idea or the main reasoning uh, behind having an upgradable version for uh, ingestion is as you've seen in, uh, uh, as, you, as you might have seen in the previous demo, uh, the process of ingestion goes through uh, uh, getting the transactional attributes or fetching the transactional attributes from the legacy systems and then interacting with the ingester smart contract to be able to generate the royalties. But different forms of products may have, or different forms of contracts may have different ways in which the uh, royalties are calculated. It may so happen that there may be some uh, ahead in time distribution of royalties that need to, allocation of royalties that needs to happen either based on some business requirements which stipulate how revenue needs to be allocated pre and post uh, calculation of royalties or uh, or even for that matter, if there are certain products which do not, which need special treatment uh, or, as, uh, or a special filtering condition for de dealing with how calculate, uh, royalties are calculated and so on. So all these variations of how transactions can be ingested is something that we are currently uh, developing to use upgradability patterns. Now I'll go over each of the uh, architecture patterns that we have used. Um, in uh, as we went through the overarching uh, smart contract schema in the previous slide. The first of the architecture pattern, which you must have heard uh, many times through this talk and in the recent past is about the usage of non-fungible tokens like ERC721 tokens. Product token manager is a construct or is a the facility that we have in the set of uh, smart contracts in the, in the solution, which is uh, more like a, 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 a more like an extension or an interface that extends uh, the existing ERC721 uh, standard to add metadata, uh, metadata extensions. And in addition to metadata extensions, uh, we are also using some of the other uh, extensions around ERC721 tokens, which are uh, the URI storage, the ability to create different token URIs and uh, interpol uh, interpolate them between how products are identified off chain. Like for example, a product ID that is defined in product master is not relevant to, uh, or it, it may, not make, may not make a relevant point or may not be of relevance to a partner where the same game might be identified with a different ID in their systems. This is where we leverage product token manager to create a unique master data of sorts on the blockchain to identify the different product tokens and in doing so, we use this ERC-727 standard and use the ERC-727 URI storage in particular. In addition, we also use the ERC-721 enumerable uh, standard 
to be able to enumerate the different tokens, not just in terms of uh, uh, not just in terms of listing them or uh, uh, or paginating them for UI purposes, but also to be able to manage the ownership of those enumerable tokens across different owners and uh, and uh, and different partners for that matter. Um, finally, the agreements here are uh, more like a, a, a small storage pattern or a data, uh, uh, more of an unstructured st storage pattern that we use uh, for creating agreements, wherein every product that are associated or every product token that is created is associated to an agreement by means of uh, a linkage. The linkage we use is somewhat more straightforward like a mapping, but in the recent past, we have also upgrade, uh, updated this uh, in view of uh, errors that you see on Solidity like stack 2 deep and uh, inline assembly errors to ensure that uh, in view of those errors, we have updated, we are updating some of these uh, agreements so that uh, we can use multiple product IDs or multiple product tokens to refer to the same uh, terms and conditions so that we don't have to repeat the process of redeploying product tokens over and over again, every time a new agreement needs to be created or an agreement needs to be changed. The next pattern I'll go over is registry. It's uh, it's one of the patterns. Uh, it's one of the patterns in uh, in path of us uh, trying to make the contracts upgradable as well. Uh, a lot of times, in terms of uh, smart contracts, or at least one of the common notions that we know about smart contracts is that once you have a smart contract that is deployed, it is very difficult to change, or it's almost impossible to change the state of that smart contract. Uh, without uh, undergoing a lot of antics using uh, inline assembly and so on. So our approach or our path to that started off with using uh, a registry pattern where we use a registry as a version controller to manage a catalog of different contractual agreements. So every set of royalty contract factory product token manager is linked or associated with the registry which maintains different versions of itself and also the different uh, royalty contract catalogs and the product token managers. And a similar pattern, we extend the registry uh, to also be linked to what we have as ingestion registry. Ingestion registry is more of a controller or more of a control point to manage ingestions based on stipulating conditions or stipulating business conditions. One example of such condition is when you need to reprocess transactions. Many a time, it so happens that transactions that are processed uh, to calculate, or to, sorry, to calculate royalties and generate statements, need to be reversed or corrected, and uh, to facilitate those corrections and specific constraints that might apply when you are up, uh, applying any form of reversals and corrections, we use in the ingestion registry in that place. Um, next, we go into the plugin pattern. The plugin pattern is uh, more of uh, something that has evolved over time. In uh, in its usage, we use uh, in its usage we have a calculation factory. Again, a factory based pattern to be able to generate different calculation contracts, which are essentially snippets of small solidity functions, which uh, are based on interface. And the interface specifies the standard attributes or the attributes that are needed to be. Uh, or leveraged for calculating the final royalties. So it's an interface to uh, a generic calculation type and also the different implementations which determine the earned royalty. Uh, a key aspect over here uh, uh, in using calculation factory is that one, we would want uh, to be using this calculation interface as a plugin in the sense, if there are any changes in calculations or if there is any change in the way a certain logic works, like for example, if uh, say today you want to calculate a royalty based flat royalty based on say some X percent, but tomorrow if you have that X, uh, but tomorrow if you have a condition to say that if X percent is not meeting a required revenue, then uh, do not calculate some royalty. So such sort of stipulating conditions determine changes or have variations of those calculation modules or calculation logical inter uh, interfaces. So hence uh, the pattern for, uh, hence the plugin or, or strategy uh, pattern as, as it is also called uh, in, as in use here. Uh, one last point about calculation factory and, one, uh, and rationale for sort of separating it out as individual components 
is also in the path to uh, public blockchain. The idea is that while different smart contracts on this network uh, around the product uh, managing of tokens, managing of contractual agreements and uh, calculations, uh, sorry, uh, uh, ingestion can be managed on chain. Uh, the, the aspect of calculation when it needs to be made private or when it needs to be made completely secret from uh, of, uh, on the public mainnet, this pattern allows for translating these calculation fact factory or calculation contract components into corresponding uh, off-chain proofs. Uh, I know we have more on that coming on day four, but the idea here is that each of these calculation factories, or sorry, each of these calculation contracts can in turn be looked at as replaceable uh, zero-knowledge proofs or uh, mediations for interacting or integrating with the mainnet. The final pattern which I'll go over is uh, upgradability. Uh, so upgradability is uh, is quite a uh, quite, uh, quite a detailed topic and quite a uh, quite a topic of contention and security issues and issue and questions around the complications of how to man manage inline assembly. So the approach that we have taken for upgradability was uh, somewhat honed over uh, almost a period of a year as we started off with using some basic proxy patterns that were initially introduced to some of the more uh, standardized or some of the more uh, evolved patterns that we have today, like EIP 1967 and 2535. Um, the rationale for using uh, upgradable constructs was uh, mainly twofold. One, while registry that we have uh, uh, that we have established or we have gone over from the previous slide, uh, as makes a good placeholder for referring to different versions or having a version control for the different smart contracts. Uh, whenever there is a data that needs to be also translated or also uh, persisted across various versions of the smart contracts, uh, the proxy contract pattern is a, a more live, viable pattern because of the reasons that is that because of the reasons around the fact that delegate calls can make your contract execution be delegated away from your primary contract. So in short, the way proxy contracts work, as uh, most of uh, as most of the developers might know, is that a, a delegation or a deployment of any smart contract is delegated out of the context of its own, so that any data or logic interplay can then be proxied out or delegated out to the other contracts as well, or sorry, other implementations. So here we use this particular uh, form of uh, proxy upgradability pattern against ingestion registry. Cases when we would need to modify the way we ingest instead of using standard calculation parameters or standard calculation terms, there are many a time when there can be deviations or uh, modifications in those calculation terms. So in that sense, uh, we use a proxy pattern uh, to establish a way to have multiple forms or multiple deployments of the ingester or the ingestion logic. And we use a controller uh, to navigate or to monitor across those different forms of ingestion and uh, accordingly calculate royalties. Um, the other important aspect uh, of uh, upgradability that we also gotten into is the uh, aspect of security. Uh, in the recent past, many security vulnerabilities have been pointed out around how the unstructured storage can be used or how unstructured storage can be leveraged on the blockchain. Typically, when uh, any form of datum is stored on the blockchain, is usually in, uh, treated in the form of slots that fill into an EVM. Many a time, what happens is that even after you upgrade the contract and the context, even after the context is retained, uh, some of the uh, some of the state variables that are uh, that need to be inherited, they do not get inherited uh, because of either of uh, either a change in the uh, functional signature, uh, adding new arguments, or adding new parameters, or even completely changing the function altogether. In all these cases, we use uh, something uh, something called EIP 1967, which enables us to use a constant placeholder on the EVM. And use that as a basis for, uh, as used as a marking point for up upgrading the different smart contracts. So in this manner, this upgradability pattern is somewhat in use uh, in, to the extent that, uh, in in a minimal format, it addresses the upgradability of just the core components that are required to be upgraded, 
and uh, and while also at, uh, while also man making sure that where upgrades are not needed, like for example in data management or logic management, those can be handled with other uh, more uh, concrete patterns like a strategy pattern or a plugin pattern. That pretty much wraps up the smart contract architecture. Um, the, I'll quickly go over some of the application learnings and then we can open the floor up for questions. So uh, as part of this last slide, some of the, I, I'll go over the application learnings that are more or less divided into four different areas or four functional areas. First of them is the action driven application setup where key user actions and uh, uh, and any form of user interaction are mediated through the usage of Azure Service Bus. Uh, here we use Azure Service Bus as a messaging mechanism, as a messaging interface uh, to be able to uh, provide or indicate, in, uh, indicate actions for approvals, reprocessing triggers, or even accounting integration. Uh, the Azure Service Bus is not just used for say UI notifications or UI triggers, but also in the back end for triggering some of the key functionalities, uh, things like uh, expectations management framework, uh, things like um, uh, automated approvals, automated reprocessing and automated testing are all driven using this action driven setup. Uh, one of the main learnings that we also learned was about how to handle on-chain and off-chain data. In view of the fact that there are uh, many, uh, there, there is a lot of legacy data which we do not want to store as is on chain, both for privacy reasons and also for uh, performance reasons. Uh, we came across or we come across a consistent pattern of managing blockchain interaction through smart contracts and maintaining the link or reference to an off chain. So the different products, agreements, contracts are all linked to the different, uh, their corresponding uh, data objects on the off chain using these linking patterns. The, the, the linking pattern here is either using straightforward, sometimes uh, using a hash uh, as, uh, as an identifier for any off-chain data, or uh, going, going a bit further than that, like how we used in to Product Token Manager, where we used multiple product IDs uh, to be linked to one unique identifier on the blockchain, and which, can, uh, which is a product token, which can then be used to associate to the rest of the application, uh, sorry, rest of the smart contract stack. Uh, the third aspect is the main and driven smart contract architecture strategy. Uh, by using our credibility standards and uh, some other uh, standardized, uh, uh, other ERC standards like uh, 721, 1820, and 995, we are looking at uh, leveraging some of the uh, standardized EIPs uh, to manage uh, smart contract interactions to put a placeholder for us to verifiably log any off-chain business transactions in contract and token management. The way we handle this is by uh, using, uh, is, is by using a smart contract, sorry, a con calculation contract as a placeholder for these different logical modules, which can then be integrated or which can then be replaced in the future by uh, uh, shield contracts and such uh, to verifiably log off-chain uh, uh, business transactions and verify them on-chain. Uh, the final point is the federated authentication. By in view of the fact that we have been we've been using a private uh, private blockchain solution and uh, and making it available, making the so, uh, making the calculations and the logic available to the different partners, we we are using some of the consortium management controls to be able to identify different users, their roles, and. Uh, using federated means for authenticating the different application services, specifically when it comes to managing users within an organization. Uh, that pretty much wraps the presentation. I may have about five more minutes. Uh, we can open the floor up for questions. I, I have, uh, I can ask one or two questions. Um, so, uh, so that one question that came up is, what are some of the merits of the Rocks platform and how can partners benefit from it? 
Yeah, um, I think uh, we we had a slide uh, talking about that. I'll highlight that aspect, the end-to-end -end digitization capability that we are providing with this. Uh, uh, we call it a ROCS platform. It stands for Royalties uh, uh, Calculation and Experience. Um, so end-to-end -end digitization uh, um, is uh, the broad theme that we have on the platform. Obviously, it is built on top of uh, the transparency and uh, um, the self-service audit capability that uh, is uh, uh, core to the platform as well, where uh, we have the transactions that are available on the network for anybody to view. We have uh, um, the self-audit capabilities that provides a completeness check as well as a test of one check. Um, so um, those, uh, I think, primary core uh, uh, benefits from the, uh, or the core capabilities from the platform and the benefits uh, uh, for our partners is uh, the near real-time visibility of the, um, the royalties that are earned, the transparency uh, that they get from how um, the, uh, the transactions uh, are being calculated. We have some complex uh, contract uh, uh, models that are being used, but providing that full transparency on how that uh, earned royalty was calculated uh, is another big benefit to our partners. And overall, I think the customer experience uh, uh, has been uh, truly, truly uh, different uh, from what the legacy solution provided uh, to what the solution uh, now provides with uh, lots of uh, efficiencies for the unit users to benefit from. See this other question. Uh... How is uh, upgradability addressed in view of some of the security implications that have been pointed out? Uh, I can I can take that way and give a quick answer. Uh, the, it is true that there is uh, a lot of uh, concerns and uh, especially on development uh, uh, of using inline assemblies to manage delegate calls and proxy contracts. And a lot of effort in terms of not using proxy pattern has been, uh, is something that we have, uh, we try to go over over a period of, uh, over the last year to two, to ensure that any form of upgradability that happens uh, across smart contracts is something that can be managed without using any inline assembly or, uh, uh, or any other proxy patterns uh, at the beginning. Uh, as we went along, we saw the need more and more for having at least some basic level of proxy uh, for us to be able to uh, refer to different implementations and different logical constructs. As we had seen the business need come up for managing different types of calculations and also different types of uh, different ways in which ingestion can be managed. So what we have, well, two aspects that we have uh, taken into account were one, to be able to use something like EIP 1967, which essentially uses a fixed constant size storage point on the EVM to ensure that anytime there is an, uh, anytime there is a change in the implementation contract, uh, there is no state leakage from the inheriting contract to the new contract because of a use of a static location on the EVM. Um, this one Second issue that we also encountered or a point we encountered in as we did some of the security review was about uh, knowing the fact that when a delegate, uh, when a contract is delegated out to a different implementation contract, the implementation contract should be a valid contract. It should not be like a Ethereum account address, which doesn't have any contract data. So we use some opcodes over there to ensure that any target implementation contract is a valid contract. So there's, these are two ways in which we have tried to address the, uh, some of the security issues with the, uh, in the solution. Yeah. I think we're at time. Uh, thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And now for our closing keynote by Petirius Zilgalvis, Public Sector Innovation at the Heart of a Blockchain Ecosystem.
you're free to speak. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and I think it's an honor to be here for the closing keynote. Could you please put my slides on the screen? I'm joining the an iPad due to Zoom being uh, blocked by the European Commission. Um, so my uh, presentation today is on the European Blockchain Partnership and the European Blockchain Services Infrastructure, Public Sector Innovation in the uh, Blockchain Innovation Ecosystem. Could you please put uh, the next slide on the screen, please? Thank you. The European Blockchain Partnership is a group of 29 countries and the European Commission. We help public administrations to accelerate the creation of trustworthy cross-border digital services. So we're building together the European blockchain services infrastructure. Uh, this started with the ministerial declaration where you see below, eventually 29 ministers of all these European countries have signed up. Next slide, please. Next slide, okay, thank you. Um, this is the next, these are the, uh, yes, there we go. The are the uh, use cases that we have. And EPSI, you can say, is the first EU-wide blockchain infrastructure. It's designed as a market-friendly ecosystem based on open standards and a transparent governance model. People often talk about what is a decentralized or a permissioned blockchain, or let's say a centralized one. I would say that in our opinion, the centralization, decentralization is kind of a spectrum. Our blockchain is um, permissioned. Right now it's the member states and the European Commission that are operating the nodes, but um, it reflects the multi-level governance model of the European Union. So right now we have the 29 different countries and the European Commission operating nodes, but eventually this will go into multiple departments and uh, entities at the national level, but also to regional municipal level um, nodes and applications. So this is something that we're going to, this will not be completely decentralized like uh, some of the uh, the public blockchains, the open blockchains, um, but it will have hundreds and maybe even thousands of nodes. So at least for a cross-border governmental infrastructure, quite relatively decentralized. And again, reflecting this multi-level governance. Um, I should emphasize that it's a public good. EPSI's administration is responsible for orienting its use toward the creation of public services at first. There also can be an opening, and this is foreseen in the declaration, for public-private partnership. The governance, the FCC governance system is ensuring that decisions are reached through building consensus among the stakeholders. So we don't have formal voting. We try to make sure that everyone is on board, though obviously a voting mechanism could be utilized at some point in the future if this is necessary. Harmonization is also part of the equation. FC governance should encourage and maintain the harmonization of technical requirements and architecture to prevent the proliferation of protocols and conflicting architectural assumptions. So obviously we don't want conflict or chaos in a common infrastructure. Open source, whenever possible, the code base for all EPSI services and structures should be open source to allow maximal auditing, security, and healthy competition between service providers, vendors, and private sector concerns building on top of the infrastructure. EU regulatory compliance, uh, Obviously, I mean, this is an initiative of the European institutions, but EPSI must not only comply with, but have model compliance with the GDPR's current interpretation and ongoing refinement. 
and be aligned with EIDS, cybersecurity, that's network information security. Um, also the green agenda, we aim for using consensus mechanisms that are environmentally friendly and are not wasting energy. Next slide, please. So right now, um, next slide, please. There it is, thank you. Um, EPSI supports the creation of cross-border services for citizens to manage their own identity and educational credentials, or for public authorities to trace documents and share data. So these uh, use cases are document traceability, European self-sovereign identity, and diploma management. Then we have trusted data sharing, which sometimes I call reg tech, regulatory reporting. Right now it's being utilized by the tax part of the European Commission, tax bid for regulatory reporting. And then we have three new use cases that are in the initiation phase, design phase. These are small and medium enterprise financing, access to finance, the European social security pass, and asylum process management. I'll underline that EBSI right now with the different member states has been operating in building this as, or the EBP more precisely, European Blockchain Partnership, has been a regulatory sandbox in building the European blockchain services infrastructure. We're building something which is not prohibited by any existing legislation, but in principle has not been addressed specifically in legislation, whether that be data protection, network information security, cybersecurity, EID, and in other areas. So we are building as we are learning and working closely together with the supervisory authorities from the different member states, as well as the European Commission, when we are building something, acting on something. And we will have a regulatory sandbox coming up that uh, will be open through the Digital Europe program for blockchain innovators and entrepreneurs from the member states, from the EU, to propose use cases that they want to test with supervisory authorities from perhaps multiple member states. And this is something that will be opening up in uh, the uh, course of this year as the Digital Europe program starts being implemented. Uh, another comment that I can make is that we have targeted legislation in areas like crypto assets, the markets in crypto assets and pilot regulation which are aiming to enable <clears throat> the use of this type of tokenization out in the ecosystem by the private sector, but also by the public sector, perhaps eventually in future use cases of the EPSI. And we're aiming to address also smart contracts and um, self-sovereign identity in other legislation, which would be the Data Act and the EU EID regulation. This complements the regulatory sandbox. The regulatory sandbox is a uh, application of uh, existing legislation to the technology. And then where it is seen that there needs to be specific legislation, then we come in with these targeted legislative initiatives. So the next slide, please. Here it is. So let's have a look at the um, at the exchange of verifiable credentials using EPSI to manage self uh, identity, self sovereign identity, and diplomas. So you have an issuer, which, for instance, would be the government or the university. You have a user, the citizen, with a wallet and a legal entity, and a verifier. And in between them, <clears throat> you see the blockchain and the EPSI services, um, EPSI uh, trusted registries. So you see where the um, A, there's a request for the verifiable credential and issuance of the verifiable credential va or validation, uh, a storage of the evidence of issuance, E, the checking of the attributes of the verifiable credential, D, where there's a presentation of it, and F, um, you have it onboarded on the DID registry. 
So uh, this is a little bit uh, a diagram about the way that it is going to work. Next slide, please. Thank you. And so EPSI, uh, Identity and Diploma Management, it's about creating an entire ecosystem. So you see government A, government B, you see the citizen at the center, um, the citizen having their personal, their wallet, and um, identity is the request and issuance of an identity credential. You see here the different ways that that could work. Um, B, also storage of evidence of the issuance of the identity credential. Um, presentation of the identity credential, checking the identity credential, anchored in a decentralized ID. This is the thing that goes into the FC ledger. Then similarly, you see again with the citizen at the center, the person being able to request and issue the uh, diploma credential. And uh, well, it's issued by the university and then store evidence of the issuance of the diploma and to be able to present it, let's say to a company in this example, or to check the, uh, the credential, which could be the university or the company turning to the FC ledger. And uh, you have the authentication and storage of credentials, again, on the wallet personal database, and then below anchored in the decentralized ID. Um, next slide, please. And final slide, I think, there it is. Uh, thank you. But just saying a few more words, I think uh, with this presentation today, I've tried to give you an idea of the way that we are moving from a overall strategy the strategy is containing the EU Blockchain Observatory and Forum, which is a bit our think tank, which also undertakes to host uh, quite a few workshops on issues like central bank digital currencies, the general data protection regulation and uh, blockchain, uh, public sector innovation and blockchain, EID and blockchain. You have all of these uh, resources at your disposal and you can find them online and there's workshops uh, coming up on issues. Uh, another recent one was on energy efficiency and especially now in our virtual virtual world still, um, they are uh, basically happening uh, remotely and everyone can join in. So if you're interested, then we have the political and implementation arm, which is the European Blockchain Partnership and EPSI. I gave some examples of the concrete work that is going on there in building and deploying these use cases this year that's, that's starting. And then how this is both enabled by, for instance, the regulatory sandbox, and then where we have seen that the part of the policy uh, requires a new legislative initiative that uh, some of these different applications, not the blockchain itself, but applications of a decentralized system of a blockchain are then addressed through regulatory proposals. Um, with that, I think I've given you perhaps as, uh, well, for some of us here in Europe, it's getting uh, towards, the, uh, towards the evening and, uh, and dinner time. And perhaps for some of you in North America, and in uh, other other parts of the world uh, uh, to the other side of the Atlantic um, it's perhaps your your early afternoon so I'll finish my presentation with that and I'm very happy to also answer any questions that you might have and we're happy to make this uh, presentation available to you so you didn't have to try to take notes with a lot of complicated arrows and lines uh, but uh, the, the uh, organizers can uh, and distribute it to you. Um, happy to hand the floor back to, uh, to the chairperson or uh, to try to answer questions myself if I do see them on the uh, on the screen. Paul's joined us. Paul, welcome back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much for your presentation. And we will indeed be sharing your presentation to all the participants at, at the EY site and as we did yesterday, we will have all of our content um, 
Uh, it'll be chaptered out. It'll be available. The replay will be available on YouTube as well. Uh, the, uh, the classes today were amazing. In fact, they were so good that uh, uh, somebody at EY thought was worried, like, hey, do you know you're giving these great classes and they're, they're streaming publicly? Yes, we do know. So, uh, and that is, is an indication of how good things are. Now, in case you were wondering, yes, I am receiving t-shirts. We've got a really nice one here from the folks at Proof of Attendance Protocol. And the QR code is showing for the last time today. So these uh, QR codes are for a Proof of Attendance Protocol token. You get one for each day of the blockchain summit you attend. So this is our second day. This is two of the four that you can collect. Um, for future reference, this one is a little bit large for me. So uh, I'm more of a like a, 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 a medium sized t-shirt guy. It does make me look a little big, but I'm gonna be honest with you. There is no way my arms are ever gonna be big enough to really kind of fill out this t-shirt. So um, uh, medium sized t-shirts for me in the future, if you want me to wear them, uh, we're hopefully gonna get a few more t-shirts in. And uh, that's pretty much it. I wanna say again, thank you. Thank you first and foremost to the folks at the Ethereum finance community who have put their sticky up. I wanna say thank you to all of our speakers today, which were absolutely amazing. The classes were real classes. I wanna say thank you to uh, Dr. Kyriakos and to uh, uh, Jamie Canterbury for their participation. And I wanna say thank you to our amazing operations and video and marketing team who have put this together. Uh, and I think as we did yesterday, we've got some closing credits to roll. Uh, and uh, before we roll those closing credits, I'm just gonna say one more thing, which is we have an amazing day lined up for tomorrow. So tomorrow is our focus is on finance, tax and accounting. And we will be talking about, uh, we'll be doing a deep dive into Bitcoin. We'll be doing a, a very deep dive into uh, tax, tax data sharing. And we'll be talking about uh, the future of financial assets. And we're closing the day with what I think is gonna be a very, very exciting keynote talk by David Trainer, who's gonna talk about how you value these blockchain-based decentralized protocols, right? He's done an analysis of the valuation of Coinbase, a very traditional discounted cash flow. And he's taken on the very challenging question of how would you evaluate, say, a decentralized exchange in comparison to, say, a centralized one? So uh, something to look forward to tomorrow. Until then, uh, good afternoon, good evening, or in the case of uh, East Asia, good morning. And thanks for participating. And let's roll our thank you credits again for today.